but I think the development of full artificial intelligence will spell the end of the human race. It's a flying object, and we don't know what it is. I would hope somebody is checking it out. I'm glad the Pentagon is looking at this, because if it poses a threat, I want them on top of it. Well, the craft generates its own gravitational field. So you said there's light in the sky? The internet has become the command center for criminals and terrorists. That's, that's what we're instructed to say. Roswell, Area 51, alien kept deep under the ground. Michael Strange, and hello to all of you who may also have troubled minds. What's going on, guys? This is the show where we get together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific, and we talk about all the things we're not allowed to talk about. You know what those things are. Aliens, conspiracy, the paranormal, the government, academia, the 24-hour news cycle, propaganda, and the general feeling that we live in the upside down. And we got a doozy for you tonight. As we're streaming in all the right places, that would be, of course, YouTube, DLive, Rockfin, and Twitter. And, of course, we're broadcasting live on the Fringe FM. And, well, well, what is this all about? It's about all kinds of things. It's about, this show is about the right to be wrong. This show is about all of that stuff that we just mentioned. And, of course, this show is about you. It's about your reality. It's about the reality we live in and how... Basically, it's a huge fight. Uh, Alex Jones infamously uh, coined the phrase Infowars when he created his show way back in the day. And uh, I, you know, at the time, I've said this before, but at the time, I didn't think that uh, it was a true thing. Uh, I was not paying enough attention uh, to the media, the way they were lying and slandering and uh, just just outright spinning fake news on the daily. But uh, turns out Alex Jones was right about a lot of things. And uh, this is this show is not about Alex Jones, by the way, just kind of making a parallel here to to reality and to not just the way the media represents your reality. Uh, it's how they want to brainwash you into believing a particular reality is the case. And so, well, as a result of that, uh, that's kind of where Troubled Minds comes in. Because, well, reality doesn't have to be what they tell you, all right? What the powers that be, the elites or the technocrats or even the government or any of those folks, uh, reality does not have to be what they tell you. It could be your own reality. And we've talked about manifesting a, a good future. We've talked about being not kind to yourself so you can be kind to others. We've talked about all kinds of things on this show, uh, uh, including, well, not uh, flinging poo at each other uh, on the internet 
uh, being able to have a conversation and disagree and still be friends at the end of it. Like there's a whole lot here, right? And speaking of changing realities, right? Changing the paradigm of uh, uh, just the way the world is supposed to work, the way we're told it's supposed to work is, uh, well, that's what this show's about. It's about all of that and more than that. It's about you. It's about me. It's about us. And, and well, that's what this show is, and that's what we do. And as a, as a result of that, we have a pretty amazing conversations here. And as you know, we we do this live. I have no no uh, no inside sources, like I say, uh, just you guys, just uh, just us, just this community, uh, just what's happening, and uh, people sharing great ideas. And and as uh, as Jay says, uh, Jay, shout out to Jay in New York, a fantastic show after fantastic show. And well, it's just because of conversations. It's because of you. It's because this show goes to ways. Uh, it's not just me uh, discussing pretty pretty wacky stuff, which I do sometimes. Uh, sometimes we talk about more, uh, you know, more uh, two feet on the ground sort of situation. But tonight we're taking both feet off the ground and we're going to slam some maybe juice and we're, uh, we're going we're gonna to bathe in it even. We're going to bathe in the maybe juice tonight because there's a lot here. There's a, there's a fantastic idea that was uh, submitted. Speaking of uh, amazing folks, there's a ton of links that went into Discord today uh, and I'll get to Discord in a second. But uh, lots of folks putting a, a some amazing ideas and thoughts up there. And I had to choose between like 20 fantastic show ideas tonight and was like, well, uh, I narrowed it down to a few and uh, consulted uh, my, my partner in crime here in the house. And, uh, and uh, she said, well, how about the space octopus? And I was like, Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do the space octopus. So, well, uh, we'll get to the space octopus and the rest of that tonight. But uh, what we're doing is this. Uh, we do this live, like I said, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7 p.m. Pacific. And the secret weapon of this show is you. And uh, this one goes out to the Night Stalker out there that's uh, uh, submitted this idea. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice article that he put in the, the Discord. And if you want to be part of the Discord and part of the show tonight, just give us a call. Phone number is 702 957 that's 702-957-1037. You can go to troubledminds.org and click the Discord link. We will give you a direct invite and put you in there with all the rest of us, all the rest of these fine folks that uh, contribute to this show on a nightly basis and uh, in the chat and uh, and call in and just all the rest of this. Like I said, the, the actual secret weapon of Troubled Minds is you because it is about getting together and sharing some wild ideas and considering that uh, maybe the reality we live in is not the one that's been advertised. And that's what this is all about. And so uh, if you want to call that phone number, click the Discord link, come join us. Uh, Discord is a free one, or it's a free program. It's actually from uh, from uh, from a great company that uh, is, is uh, like I said, we're not sponsored by Discord, but it's, it's an amazing place to get together and share photos and links and ideas and videos and all kinds of things. You can do all of that. It's a voice chat. It's a it's an actual chat chat, like typing chat, old school chat room. And all of that is kind of built into one little program program and it's it's pretty amazing stuff so if you haven't joined the discord please do troubledminds.org click the discord link and also we've got another discord running at fringe.fm slash chat please uh, join that as well and it's the same program discord uh, is free like i said and uh there you go there you go all right uh, a couple of final things uh easiest way to listen to troubled minds is to download the fringe app go to uh of course uh, all your google app store or your Apple App Store and uh, anywhere you get your apps, and it's free. Uh, download the Fringe FM app, and it will get you uh, directly to the Fringe, and you just smash the play button at uh, 7.05 precisely, uh, Monday through Thursday, and you'll get troubled minds, not to mention all the other great programming that happens on the Fringe FM as well. All right, so that is that. Uh, yeah, what's up, Night Stalker in the chat? This one goes out to you, buddy. Happy birthday to you yesterday, and uh, thank you for submitting this tonight. And we're talking about, yeah, that's right, your space octopus. And uh, what does that even mean? What in the world does that even mean? Well, ah, let us begin, shall we? <laughs> let us begin. All right, strap it, strap in, strap in. Here we go. All right, so this is a, a, uh, a an article written by an individual by the name of Jonathan McCormick. And uh, again, this is shared by uh, Derek in Massachusetts. Happy birthday again to you yesterday. So we'll call this your name day, uh, even though it's probably not officially. But uh, I missed it yesterday because I was a little late to the game. But uh, let's do the space octopus. And we'll talk about this tonight. So this article was submitted by, of course, uh, Derek in Massachusetts here, written by John Jonathan McCormick. And yeah, well, the, it, the beginning starts like this. And we're going to get to some wild, wild spots here as we go. But uh, it begins like this. Are we being controlled by a super intelligent psychic alien octopus 
from the future. Yeah, you heard what I said. <laughs> you heard that. Uh, and it says, scientifically speaking, yes. All right, all right. So that's where we're going to begin tonight. And there's a lot to this, okay? It, it goes uh, it goes pretty da- deep down several rabbit holes, including we're going to get to the trickster, um, the trickster spirit and that archetype. We're going to get to, uh, of course, what these, the, why, why a space octopus? Uh, what is the rest of this stuff? Uh, what's actually going on with this? Because there, there's a lot here uh, regarding, uh, you know, DNA structures of uh, entities on Earth. That would be, of course, human beings and uh, other, other vertebrates and invertebrates, which, of course, would be the octopus. Uh, and, and there's a lot. There's a lot with this. And uh, it's been said, if you guys watch, you know, Ancient Aliens, you guys know the, the thing, ancient astronaut theorists say yes. Well, uh, there's been a, a lot of talk and chatter in the scientific community um, regarding, of course, the bizarre DNA structure of an octopus. And actually, uh, in, in the sense that they think that they may be alien in nature, like they're so different from anything on Earth and so wildly intelligent for what we expect them to be that, um, well, there's a whole lot to this. So we'll, we'll get into all that on why it's a space octopus. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll get into some archons while we're at it tonight because trickster spirits and archons and space octopi apparently go tentacle in hand and there we go all right so so that's where we be where we begin tonight now now the thing is this right so we're going to get to this article i'm not going to use this we're going to use this article as sort of a a basis like a premise to kind of start this conversation tonight but we're not going to do too much of going deep into this article itself if you want to read it uh do the uh, do do the thing click it down and below the it's all it's all as you all know i love to share my sources because um there's um, amazing things happening out there on the internet and uh, again people sharing things with each other and all the rest of this so there's the article i'm linking it in the chat if you guys want to talk about this or, or I'm sorry, read it yourself and kind of get the uh, the uh, uh, the premise in your brain here. But okay, so as we go, let's talk about the octopus first. All right. Now, in, in uh, terms of, um, you know, DNA and evolution and the rest of this, uh, let's go to this. Let's see. Um, let's see. What do we got? Which one here? How about, let's see, not the octopus. Here we go. All right. So this is from a blog.podi.com. Facts about octopuses that prove they're aliens. Is it octopuses or octopi, by the way? I was told in the, the old, old, old days it was octopi, but I think it's, I've seen people write octopuses. Anyway, here we go. Staring into the depths and beauty of our water planet, many ocean lovers may not realize that the answer to where did the octopus come from might lie in the exact opposite direction of where we're looking. While Darwinism would have you believe that life was created from the primordial soup, another theory, panspermia, maintains the belief that certain aspects of life and evolution may have developed due to seeds of matter that came to Earth from other planets. Uh, Before you laugh, just keep in mind that scientists estimate there are more than 100 billion planets within the Milky Way galaxy and possibly 100 billion galaxies in the universe. That's 10 to the 22nd power planets that could potentially hold life. All right, this is where it gets wild. You ready for this? Strap in. Get your maybe juice ready. In 2018, a group of 33 scientists published a paper purporting that the ancestors of the modern-day octopus arrived on Earth from one of these planets' seeds. Here's the evidence they presented for why these amazing marine mammals actually came from space and we can uh, stop there for just a second uh, to consider well how did we get here (laughs) how did this happen uh well uh, ancient astronaut theorists definitely say yes and uh there's a there's a lot of uh, pretty weird stuff with this octopus here and again like i said uh, dna structure wise the fact that they can change their rna on the fly which you may or may not have known which is pretty wild uh they're uh, devilishly intelligent um there's a lot uh, that kind of goes into this with the idea that an octopus is so alien to earth itself that uh there have been some you know ancient astronaut theorists among others that have said that uh that well these things may be aliens these things may have come from uh been seeded with this this panspermia from another star system or another galaxy or who knows and well that's what we're talking about tonight as we begin and that that's just a start because uh this gets wild this this gets more wild than you can ever imagine because well we're not just talking about space octopus uh octopus as it were uh, we're, we're talking about well 
what they are, which is, let's do this. According to evolution, animals with the most adaptive characteristics will likely survive and reproduce more than disadvantaged animals, therefore passing down these traits which change and refine over time, creating evolution as we know it. But the octopus is a little different. The main characteristics we associated with octopuses, large, non-centralized brain, camouflage abilities, which we were talking about a little bit last night. Uh, shout out to Kelly if you're out there listening. Uh, 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 and let's see, uh, camouflage abilities and flexible bodies all appeared on the evolutionary scene quite suddenly during the Cambrian explosion. Before then, the octopus's ancestors looked very different. Most notably, they were shelled, shelled organisms, okay? Uh, one of the earliest fossils of this era called the Nectucaris uh, it shows a rather sudden divergence from this shelled creature to a non-shelled creature. While scientists have been debating over the last 30 years why this fossil really me- what it means for cephalopods, it does cast doubt on the idea that they evolved like other animals. All right, all right. Now, so there's a there's there's a, some pretty weirdness here with the octopus in that uh, their DNA hasn't changed in a very 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 long time, right? So standard evolution says that um, we. Uh, we mutate, right? Uh, as part of part of the evolutionary process, Darwin, Darwinian evolution, we mutate based on uh, you know even birth defects and things like this, uh, real mutations. And as those things happen and change what we are, we uh, gain advantages or disadvantages in the Savage Garden. Well, that would be well nature and earth. And so with that said, of course, uh, this is basics. Everybody knows this stuff. I'm not telling anybody anything that's not widely known here. But um, the octopus itself doesn't actually do it that way. They don't do it. Yeah, I got, I got that one right there. Yeah, I got that article. We'll get to that in a sec. Uh, so here we go. So they, they've been uh, sort of the same DNA structure for millions of years, apparently. And uh, they haven't changed because they're able to actually change on the fly in moments, change their RNA in a moment, which seems pretty crazy, right? So not only are they super smart, here we go, uh, the, their intelligence go, uh, goes far beyond simply moving through mazes or opening jars. Octopuses are some of the only invertebrates to use tools. They can uh, wield external weapons such as the way the blanket octopus carries tentacles from the Portuguese man of war and they hunt collaboratively with other species sometimes having to give their fish partners a good punch to keep them in line and a lot of this uh, is actually uh, uh, kind of uh, swiped and put into that other article we started with actually even word for word here um, but that's okay because we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants anyway so not only are these octopuses smart they've got personality and exhibit eerily human traits octopuses are often mischievous such as this octopus that climbed out of its tank to give visitors a more personal greeting. uh, There's also Inky the octopus who infamously escaped the National Aquarium of New Zealand in the dead of night by opening his own tank and slipping through a drain in the floor which led to the ocean. Other octopuses have been purported uh, spitting jets of water to short out aquarium lights that were bothering them and even sneaking into other tanks for a midnight snack. Whoa, ho, ho, there we go. All right, so n- not only that, right? So it gets even more strange with this. So again, this is from uh, blog.patty.com, and they're talking about uh, how bizarre the octopus is, and even alien in the sense that uh, they are not of this earth, right? They're so strange DNA-wise that they kind of don't really fit into, uh, well, d- the Darwinian uh, uh, evolution as we would expect. And so uh, and not only that, the, the divergence is huge. So anyway, let's uh, get back to this. Uh, Perhaps the most alien part of an octopus is something we can't even see. In their efforts to map the genomes of the entire animal kingdom, scientists have discovered some interesting facts. For one, the octopus has 33,000 protein-coding genes. As a comparison, humans have around 20,000. But despite its complexity and therefore higher probability of mutation, octopus DNA has changed very little compared to the speed of change in other animals. So they're not evolving, right? They're not actually evolving in that Darwinian scale, even over millions of years. So it makes you wonder, what secret do they have that we don't have? And yeah, there you go. Uh, makes you think about the UFO that when it goes underwater. What's up, Matt? In California, I see there in the chat. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's part of this too, right? Uh, if you, if we're talking about aliens and we're talking about UFOs, which we do on the show quite often, uh, I think you get to a certain point where. Um, 
you've you got to realize, just like we've said, is that you know only 5% of the ocean is even mapped. Uh, there are some depths of the ocean that's never been seen by human eyes. Things like this, right? You would expect some of these, if, if you were an alien of, of sorts with a, this advanced propulsion techniques and a, the ability to transmedium travel and all the rest of that, you would probably be underwater at some point, right? Just to hide from us, to hide from uh, the, the nuclear bombs or whatever, right? That are, that's happening up here and the, all, all, the, all the sick stuff that people do up here on the surface. So that part cer- certainly seems to track and make sense that maybe, well, uh, again, let's uh, bathe in the maybe juice, but there's, uh, there's some pretty wild stuff here with these the octopus itself um so here we go so let's continue with this uh so it is that uh if dna is what sets the uh the instructions for life the uh rna is what receives those messages and then makes things happen and this is where it gets super weird with the octopus all right where it starts to not just become this super intelligent slimy thing with these tentacles and all the rest of this right um well it has actually what you would call maybe superpowers check this out if uh, so uh, so okay octopuses can bypass the need for genetic mutations and consciously give their rna new instructions to alter their physiology uh, physiology pretty much immediately while other species abandoned this ability hundreds of millions of years ago due to its overall detrimental effects it seems this method is working out pretty well for the octopus and okay as we begin as you start to see what's going on here there's a lot of weirdness with the octopus but don't worry we're going to get to the space octopus we're going to get get to time travel we're going to get to the trickster spirit tonight we're going to get to all of this because there's a whole lot here with this theory and this idea so as always i'd love to hear your thoughts on this as we go have you heard the fact that the octopus has been considered a possible alien entity here on earth that's what I want to know as we begin. The very first question is that. Have you heard this? Have you heard that ancient astronaut theorists, and theorists indeed say yes regarding the uh, octopus and the fact that they could be uh, an actual alien implant from some other galaxy through, through the panspermia process? If you've heard that, let me know. If you haven't, uh, if you think this is outlandish and ridiculous and wild or somewhere in between, that's okay because that's what we do. We consider all the possibilities on this show, and uh, that's okay. Uh, either you believe it or you don't, or it's somewhere in between. And again, uh, whether we agree or disagree, and... Uh, 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 at least we're going to have uh, tell, a, tell a good, fun story and uh, at least be able to, to shake our heads and giggle a little bit tonight and then uh, still be friends tomorrow regardless of who thinks what. And that's what this is all about. So one more little thing and then we'll get to a break as we go tonight. Talking about, yep, you guessed it, uh, the space octopus, right? Exactly. The trickster spirit. We're going to get to a bunch of that as we go, but let's do this. In addition to their intelligence, we're talking about the octopus now personalities and complex biology some octopuses seem to exhibit otherworldly powers between 28 and 2010 paul the octopus was regularly asked to pick the winners of fifa games that would be soccer games or uh, not american football football in the latin american countries and of course in europe and australia and everywhere else it's soccer here in the states but it's football everywhere else anyway out of 14 predictions paul the octopus was correct 12 times an 85 point seven percent accuracy rate yes right yes and uh there you go there you go so we got they say they have psychic powers he was able to predict 85.7 percent accuracy in fifa games this paul the octopus and i think that probably takes us to where we need to be just with the octopus bit and we're going to continue tonight and get to the trickster spirit get to probably the archons and uh this space octopus that may be controlling our reality from the future. So, of course, as we continue thinking about this and talking about this, we know what the ancient astronaut theorists say, but what say you? Well, is this outlandish? Is this giggle-worthy? Or is it not? And all the way around, I think uh, we're going to have a fun time tonight and keep talking about this crazy stuff because, well, why not? If we don't, nobody will. So... If you want to be part of this conversation, I'd love to hear your thoughts as we start. Do you think an octopus is possibly an extraterrestrial plant through the panspermia process and actually, literally, not of this earth? That's the first question tonight. Love to hear your thoughts as we continue. 702-957-1037. That's 702 702- 957-1037. This is Troubled Minds. I'm Michael Strange. Don't go anywhere. 
more psychic octopus from the future when we return. Be right back. Welcome back to Troubled Minds. I'm your host, Michael Strange, and we are streaming on Rockfin, DLive, YouTube, and Twitter, and we are broadcasting live on the Fringe FM. And we're taking your phone calls tonight as we talk about, yeah, you'll never believe this, the psychic octopus that's controlling us from the future. Sorry, I did that wrong. Psychic space octopus. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, if you want to be part of the show tonight, 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. Love to hear your thoughts on this as we go. We're going to be talking about Archons tonight, the trickster spirit, the bizarre octopus, and the, the alien DNA supposedly this thing has. Its ability to change its RNA on the fly and all the rest of this stuff. It's a pretty wild uh, wild and crazy ride we got going tonight. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Um, oh, uh, yes, you are correct. You are correct. James uh, helping me out here. I am not on the air on Discord. I am now. Okay, there we go. All right. So uh, there we go. So so that's what we're doing tonight. So as we as we get going in the bottom of the hour here, we're, we were talking about this uh, octopus. All right. The how the octopus. Uh, they say that there was a panspermia. Right. That the, the octopus was not really. Uh, part of the evolution, the regular evolutionary process on Earth. And some of these scientists, and of course, here's the actual paper itself from Science Direct, uh, they describe the uh, the cause of the Cambrian explosion, which of course is when the octopus uh, actually did its thing and started to become a something on planet Earth. Uh, the, The title of the paper here is A Cause of Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or cosmic. And yes, of course, as you would expect, uh, we reveal the salient evidence consistent with or predicted by the Hoyle, oh boy, Wick Ramasing uh, thesis of cometary biology. Much of this physical and biological evidence is multifactorial. One particular focus of, are the recent studies which date the emergence of the complex retroviruses of vertebrate lines or at just before the Cambrian explosion. Uh, such viruses are known to be plausibly associated with major evidence evolutionary genomic process processes. Uh, we believe this coincidence is not fortuitous, but is consistent with a key prediction of the HW theory, whereby major extinction diversification evolutionary boundaries coincide with virus bearing cometary bolide bombardment events. Get that? The, uh, the virus bearing cometary bolide bombardment, which means, of course, that uh, they're, sa- they're, they're taking this, uh, the Cambrian explosion in, in actual life, in terms of life on Earth, and they're d- actually considering the fact that this may have been some sort of actual um, uh, panspermia situation. Like maybe there was a comet that hit Earth and brought like a whole bunch of like different uh, uh, crazy microorganisms and whatnot that became uh, these octopuses or these these octopi, right? I think that's the way, I think that's the way you're actually supposed to say it, but everybody on the internet seems to write octopuses, plural. Uh, it sounds wrong. But anyway, okay, so uh, what do we got? Uh, lots of, I'm reading the chat and uh, listening to, checking out everybody out there, seeing how everybody's doing. But I don't know, so what do you think? Regarding this, I think that uh, there's a little bit of strangeness to this as we start, just because of, again, the, the Cambrian explosion, the, the fact that they, they want to attribute the, the octopus and uh, the cephalopod in, in particular to to this panspermia event in the Cambrian. And so the weird part is, if you're talking about alien DNA sort of seeded onto this planet, that's a thing called panspermia. And, you know, we've talked about in the past uh, on this show, of course, the the, the whole, uh, our, our DNA has been modified possibly by extraterrestrials and the whole Anunnaki theory and some of this other stuff, right? And again, uh, drinking the maybe juice, I'm not saying any of this stuff is true or it's not. I'm saying that uh, it's, it's a thing and people talk about it and people consider it as being true in one way or the other. So I think it's worth talking about and worth thinking about. So, so back to the octopus here and why they're so bizarre is that uh, they think that this is part 
part of it is that it actually came from uh, during this Cambrian explosion a couple hundred million years ago. It was actually a uh, kind of in, uh, just uh, uh, maybe just bam, like uh, dropped here on a, on a comet or a meteor or something to that effect through that panspermia event. And well, uh, where they can't probably track it down because it's been far too long to actually track down, uh, you know, if, if uh, how many comets or meteors or whatever hit us way back when, uh, they can speculate that the DNA divergence be- between the cephalopod and ourselves is so different that it's been uh, described as actually being uh, alien in, uh, in origin and alien in DNA. So and there's a bunch of reasons for that. So, so as we go tonight, let's go back to this original premise. And again, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Like I said, I know we're a little off the rails tonight. Like Matt said, we're just going to go without rails tonight. We're not even going to start on the rails. We're just going to just go jump in the little space cruiser and just head right off outside the galaxy because why the hell not, right? Nobody tells us what to think and nobody tells us what to say. So this is the thing, right? Back to this article from Jonathan McCormack, and he's he's uh, discussing this as well. Yeah, uh, this particular space octopus, as these things actually came from space, meaning, of course, this panspermia. So you got to consider if, right? If that's the case, this Cambrian explosion was brought about by some sort of panspermia event, then that means the alien DNA of the octopus exists elsewhere. Okay, and so not only elsewhere probably for a very, very long time, because we're talking about uh, approximately 200 million years back to the Cambrian explosion. But then we're also considering the fact that if that DNA came in that, uh, that panspermia event, whether it's a meteor or a comet, that actually that, octopo- that, that cephalopod or octopus DNA would have been already, who knows, maybe a billion years old. It's hard to say because you'd have to be able to pinpoint it back to the original octopus planet they came from, wouldn't you? Well, and that's why we're just starting without rails tonight because well, here we are. Co- copy that, James. We'll get to you in just a sec here. So, so, the, so the thought is this, right? If, if this, this idea of the Cambrian explosion and this panspermia event that brought the cephalopod to Earth, all right, if that's the thing, then you have to consider that somewhere else, maybe in this galaxy, maybe in some other galaxy, there are octopi that actually have been around for a very long time. And as we know, they're incredibly smart now here on Earth. But what about ones that were around a billion years ago? Maybe on different planets and doing whatever, <laughs> doing whatever else, and uh, that's and that's where this really begins, and that's where the space octopus comes in because they think that it was planted here through that one of those type of events, and so I don't know. What are your thoughts on this as we begin? And this gets deeper because, of course, uh, we don't just have the space octopus; we have the psychic ability that they've uh, considered with um, the the uh, what was his name? What was the octopus's name there? The uh, what's his name? What's his name? I can't remember. Let's find his name real quick. So their their actual cosmic powers. Remember, let's uh, talk about uh, was it Sam? No, Paul. Paul the octopus was asked to pick the winners of FIFA games. And the way they did that actually is they put the two teams in jars, and the octopus Paul, of course, would have to uh, decide which was the winner and open the jar himself and pull out the winning. Uh, whatever it was, a little bobble that they put inside the jar. All right. Now, the, the crazy part is that before Paul the octopus actually did this with these, you know, quote, psychic powers, he would stop and contemplate. He would actually consider between one thing and the next somehow, of course, not even speaking our language or even understanding what a damn soccer game is or football for you non Americans out there. Uh, but, uh, he would, Paul the octopus would stop and consider a moment like he was in some sort of meditation, some sort of trying to figure out what exactly was going, was needed of him before he selected the winning team. And again, 85.7% accurate, albeit, of course, a small sample size, which is why we're just bathing in maybe juice tonight, because why the hell not? But, of course, uh, they say that this was uh, probably better than any known psychic in history uh, that, that was able to select these things. Are we just calling this dumb luck at this point? 
Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's uh, that's that's exactly what what needs to be discussed here and why we're talking about this. So we begin this with the space octopus. All right. Of course, because they came through as some sort of panspermia event and ended up here on Earth sometime just after the Cambrian explosion or just before, actually, and possibly causing that. Uh, so. With that, how this begins is there. There's your premise. There's your space octopus. Uh, And, well, uh, we'll get to him being psychic, which we just talked about, and then how this goes even further off the rails in just a moment. So, as we continue, love to hear your thoughts as we start this. This is, again, an article from Jonathan McCormick on Medium, and uh, the links are all down below, again, sent to us tonight by the Night Stalker. Uh, Happy birthday again to Derek, uh, yesterday belated. Uh, It was his birthday yesterday, but uh, this is right down his alley. We're kind of talking... Cthulhu in space, aren't we? The tentacled, <laughs> omniscient octopus from the future. Yep, it may as well be Cthulhu. So, okay, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. If you want to be part of the show tonight, 702 957 1037. That's 702 957 1037, and we'll put you on the show. Easy as that. You can also click the Discord link at troubledminds.org. Let's go to uh, our good buddy James Salcedo of Salcedo Paranormal. What's up, brother? How are you? Welcome to Troubled Minds. What's going on? Thank you. Um, yeah, very, very interesting topic, and based on everything you said, it doesn't seem as strange to me as um, as I, I don't know, it just doesn't seem as strange to me. Uh, the, the things about the, the, about the octopus, the octopus though, and the tanks moving around and escaping, and that's really fascinating. Yeah, well, and it, it, that's that's just the beginning. Like, so they've been known to again uh, uh, squirt water to turn lights off, like they said, to short out lights that were bothering them. Uh, yeah, that's they wild. apparently have been smart enough to pick on a particular staff in in aquariums. Like when a particular person comes into the room, they'll squirt them with water, like a particular person. So they've literally singled out like a person to bully, right? Things like this. Like it's a uh, it, it's one of those situations where you're like, wait a minute, like this is not just some animal having a good time. This is some sort of sense here some sort of bizarre intelligence happening but yeah so there's not only that but then the fact that they can change their rna at will that's the bizarre part is that uh that's why they've been kind of locked into the same evolutionary uh uh state for millions of years because they don't need evolution like uh the regular uh rest of the world does they can kind of just decide on the fly we, we've talked about their camouflage proper properties in the past a little bit last night even we talked about that because of the cloaking show we did but i mean regarding all of that i think you you start to see the the larger picture here that there might be something more let's say menacing inside these uh these octopi as it were i don't know what do you think yeah um i had heard of the idea that they were alien not in the detail that that you brought up tonight but that's a really interesting idea um and based on the the Everything you brought up tonight, I mean, I, I can't say it's impossible. What's really interesting is to think of what they would be like a million or a billion years in the future. If they would ever evolve to a point where, as your title suggests, or as you suggested, where they could be um, interacting with us from our future, their present that's a whole other thing because I sent, I mentioned in the chat that a lot of paranormal activity seems to be mischievous, whether it's poltergeist or whether it's with with things that are cryptids or aliens. Even in some cases where people don't even know what to describe whatever it is they've experienced or they've seen or heard. Um, so it's really interesting to think that that could be. That there could actually be a form to this whole trickster element that has been talked about in the paranormal for a long time now. Yeah, that the trickster spirit is an interesting idea here with the archetype of that because it's not just um, you know everybody knows Loki, the the infamous Norse trickster god, right? Of course, in in the Marvel comics and all the rest of that, but uh, it's not the only um, actual uh, uh, you know mythology where that exists. 
uh, like everybody's kind of got their their own archetype of a trickster spirit or a trickster god, and that's I think that's where this kind of comes into where um, we got the Charles Fort idea of not just evolution happening the way Dar- Darwin suggested, but instead that some of these things are maybe uh, out of our hands in terms of not just on this on this earth, but also uh, from possibly like we've described on the show often is is that uh, there's could be some of these interdimensional aspects with this including well if uh, again like you said what happens if you have an octopus that's been alive uh, the, at least at least sentient for a billion years right not not in particular i just mean the species and where did they come from and that's that's the weirdness of all this because well when you start to consider that uh, well are they psychic uh, i mean you know it's we're talking football in a small sample size but That seemed pretty incredible that the octopus itself seemed to pause and reflect and wait and then decide which jar to open for for the predictions. Pretty wild stuff. Um, And yeah, so back to that paranormal thing. Uh, I think that uh, this trickster trickster spirit stuff is... is, um, I, I don't think it's too far off the rails here because in terms of, you know, maybe an entity controlling people on this earth uh that uh, that theory comes up with the gnostics and archons i'm sure you've heard of archons before haven't you yeah mainly through actually mainly through this show but um but yeah no it's that's um and that's possible i could explain why some people do things that just don't make sense or even why in some cases people say that they don't know why they did something and they can't explain it. It's not even, they don't even say, like, they don't even make the traditional claim of, I was possessed. They just have no idea. You know? Um, and you can go to, either, to as big or small a scale as you want with that. You know? So, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, pretty wild, pretty wild. This idea, and so we'll we'll get to we'll get to uh, what the rest of this means. With we'll get to the archons and the trickster spirit and that archetype and the rest of this stuff. Um, but I think I think the weird part is that well, uh, ancient astronaut theorists say yes, and the, you know the divergence of this uh, this evolutionary process with the actual octopus compared to pretty much everything else we've seen all over the entire Earth is odd enough to consider that maybe this is uh, some sort of for off of this planet sort of a uh, introduction into into our uh, actual like natural process which you know it doesn't seem that ridiculous because we know we were peppered with comets and you know uh, asteroids and all the rest of this we just look around now you, you know we get a we get an article every week about how we're about to get smacked with an asteroid don't we <laughs> yeah and you know what's funny about this you picking this tonight I literally read a story tonight about basically someone seeing a black orb like thing like a bl- almost like a black like a shadow orb but the thing is they said it it looked like it had tentacles ooh i've and heard they saw that this in their bedroom on on on, the, on their floor basically and it didn't do anything it just kind of was there and it moved around and then it was gone but there's just the timing of that i found that story literally today and then you're doing this tonight. That's really interesting. Ah, so you're you're actually the one uh, psychically can pull, pulling the strings here, aren't you? <laughs> that, that's what's going on. You James. got me. Are you, you got me? Are you actually an octopus, James? Mm, maybe. <laughs> I, yeah. How do be. you breathe outside the tank, James? <laughs> ah, well, you know, this technology. I mean, I I have access to technology. I mean, that's you know, come on now. I mean, you know. There's there's oxygen equipment and all that stuff. You can there's, there's a lot of things you can do now. So all right, all but right. no, it's it's really yeah. I love this topic. All right then, you keep your secrets. Fair enough, fair enough. I appreciate the call, my friend. Uh, James here has a podcast called uh, Salcedo Paranormal. Check it out. He d- talks about paranormal subjects five days a week. You can find the link to his show in the description below. Thank you, James. I appreciate you chipping in tonight and uh, getting us started breaking the ice. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Talk to you soon, my friend. 
Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. There you go. All right. Yeah, we got we got a good one here as well. Uh, Matt in the chat says the mind flare, right? The mind flare from a good old Dungeons and Dragons, right? Kind of with the Cthulhu tentacles in the front of his face. Uh, some some bizarre things happening with this. So so in any case, uh, so let's get to, to the rest of this. So now if we're considering, okay, so now this is where this gets weird. This gets super weird. So if we're considering that the octopus itself came from uh, some evolutionary uh off-world place from possibly a billion years ago or more, then that stands to reason that there's a highly adapted or possibly evolved version of the octopus somewhere out there. And when I, when I mean somewhere out there, that could be on some other planet, that could be galactically speaking, that could be, of course, well, very much like we know, uh, with the call of Cthulhu, of H.P. Lovecraft fame, the great old ones, all right? And so, oddly enough, with that, uh, the Cthulhu himself is described as a gigantic octopus-type thing with so many mouths and so many arms and so many everything to be so grotesquely huge and incomprehensibly ugly to the human spirit and psyche that just the mere sight of Cthulhu himself, this great old one, would cause madness in the person beholding him and so well here we have yep we have this there's a fossil by the name you guessed it uh it is called solacina cthulhu and as you see it on the screen here uh pretty wild stuff um they named it after the great old one of the hp lovecraft tales as i just described a study uh, published in the journal proceedings of the royal society said all right. If a uh, here we go now. Jason Reza Giorgioni asks, and this is from that uh, again Jonathan McCormick uh, article. If a two-year-old octopus has this level of ESP, what level of psychic uh, phenomenon does it have that no one thought to devise a test in order to measure? More importantly, if a monkey is to a human what an octopus is to some other cephalopod-type creature that arrived together with it through spatiotemporal vortices in the ocean 270 million, million years ago, what are the psychic capabilities of that creature? All right, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, again, a highly evolved version of this thing that uh, came to Earth, again, through this panspermia effect. And, well, what does it mean? <laughs> is all of this possible like i said uh and like uh, like derek said in the chat a little bit earlier uh where we're going tonight we don't need rails absolutely uh looking to hear your thoughts on this as we go do you think that these octopus the octopi as it were are, are actually from another space in the in the universe that's the question another planet another area another slice of dna i don't know that's the question that's on my mind tonight i see there on the phone joseph we'll get to you in just a sec i didn't want to go to you and cut you off we'll do that as soon as we get back we're running out of time here but the question is this if that is possible with where we have the octopus coming from some other space in the galaxy and of course with very very old dna through the panspermia process is it also possible that there's a, let's say, oh, I don't know, a juggernaut-like, highly evolved octopus out there somewhere in the galaxy? And if so, well, it seems very much like Cthulhu from H.P. Lovecraft. And do you think this is all possible or do you think this is all ridiculous? Love to hear your thoughts if you want to be part of the show tonight. We're doing our thing, hanging out. Got a couple phone calls we'll get to as soon as we come back. I see you guys there. Hang tight. Thanks for being patient. We'll get right with, right back to you. And uh, that's what's on my mind tonight. Where we're going, we don't need rails tonight. Bathing in the maybe juice, considering what about HP Lovecraft, Cthulhu, and the great old ones? And if the octopus came to Earth through the panspermia process... What was the origination of that DNA? Is Cthulhu somewhere out there watching over us, possibly through other dimensions and pulling strings? You tell me. Love to hear your thoughts. If you want to be part of the show tonight, 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. Taking your calls, considering all the things, bathing in the maybe juice. What do you think? What do you think? 
Cthulhu or nah don't go anywhere more space octopus Cthulhu and you when we return be right back more trouble minds on the way about the great old ones we're talking about alien dna coming to earth through the panspermia process and dropping an octopus or at least their dna back before the cambrian explosion 200 million years ago do you think this is possible some scientists have suggested it's the truth and that's what we're thinking about and talking about tonight especially considering this imagine 200 million years ago, alien DNA in the form of an octopus came from somewhere. So how evolved was that individual thing, which of course hasn't changed very much in hundreds of millions of years, uh, DNA-wise? And is it possible that it came from one Cthulhu from H.P. Lovecraft, known as a Great Old One? That's what we're considering tonight as we talk about Archons, the trickster's, trickster spirit, and all the rest of this, and uh, how, how this all fits in. Well, stay tuned, and we'll get to that. If you want to be part of the show tonight, we are streaming live on Rockfin, YouTube, DLive, and Twitter, and of course, we're broadcasting live on the Fringe FM. We're taking your phone calls at 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. You can click the Discord link at troubledminds.org, and the official, that's the official website, and the phone number's there, the Discord link is there, and it's all there. Uh, please also join the Discord at fringe.fm slash chat. I'm watching all the chat in all the places and trying to keep up with all your thoughts and ideas as we go. So... That's what's on my mind tonight. This alien DNA that came through this panspermia process, is it possible that there's a super evolved, uh, I don't know, maybe from a billion years ago or so, a super evolved space octopus out there uh, that, of course, would be none other than the mighty Cthulhu? 
from H.P. Lovecraft Mythology. So I'm not sure. I think that's the question tonight as we're bathing in the maybe juice and considering all the things. And this is a fun one. Why not? Sometimes you've got to take a leap here and uh, do some loose association and end up wherever we end up. So that's up to you, of course. Uh, as, uh, as you know, the secret weapon of this show is you. And I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on this. So thank you guys for being patient on the phones. Let's go to Joseph in Iowa. What's up, my friend? Welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Hey, how's it going? Uh, doing well, thanks. Uh, go right ahead. What What are your thoughts on this uh, octopus DNA stuff? So I was in Florida, and there's a museum in Florida. It's the shark capital of Florida. I forget the place. And uh, there's they have octopus in there, and they claim one of them. Well, they 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 have a yeah they have a claim that one of them stole did what you said earlier climbed out of the tank and stole a fish out of another tank. But since they were feeding it, like it didn't need to eat the fish, it just would bring back fish to its tank for company. Ah. So, <laughs> like... The jailbreak. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, incredibly smart. That's what they say about these the octopi. It, it's it's pretty wild. And again, you know, like I said, picking on particular staff in these aquariums, they'll squirt water at like just one dude out of like a staff of you know people that come in and feed them. They'll just pick on one guy. It's pretty crazy how smart they are. But yeah, uh, go ahead, continue. Yeah, I would say the oceans are old. I mean, I just asked my Google. I don't know if that's right, but they're like it's billions of years old. So, I mean, I'd go as far to say, I don't know how old, like, the dinosaurs are. Do you know how old the dinosaurs are? Like, when they were thrive, when they got wiped out? Yes, that, that was 65 million years ago. So, I would go as far to say that the octopus could have wiped out the dinosaurs. Who knows? Like, and then maybe, like, an asteroid hit or, and they went into the water and they just couldn't reverse their, uh, their forms. Or maybe they just don't care. Yeah. Just it, like, especially if they've been chilling, super smart. They're just chilling down there. Yeah, yeah, if they've been super smart, exactly. And, and I think that's part of the weirdness, too, is, is we can't really say whether they, maybe they did live on land at some point. And uh, they, they kind of went to, retreated to the water when that cataclysm came, when the, they say that the, the asteroid kind of hit the earth and, you know, it was a comet, I think, uh, that hit the earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, as they say. That was the Chicxulub impact, is what they call that, uh, down in the Yucatan Peninsula. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so, so it could be. I, I, like the, I like where you're uh, going with this, because uh, you've got to consider all the possibilities, right? Sure, uh, we can't say because we weren't there, and that's a hell of a long time ago. But uh, pretty wild stuff. Uh, what do you think about, so if they're super smart and they have been around for a very long time and this panspermia effect is possibly where they came from, what about the larger implication of uh, some greater entity out there that's maybe seeding the, the universe with its own DNA? Uh, but of course, it would have to be some sort of a super intelligent sort of octopus. Is that pretty wild? I would think, yeah, I mean, I, I actually thought about that a lot. It's like since we have we have like our counterparts like we have like mammals and all that stuff what like but what if they it could be that the super smart camouflage one is that upcoming intelligence you know or it could be that that one's already in space right now and possibly laughing at us right now yeah, and, and you know, I think or that's, beaming into us exactly, and that's that's the weird part here. So, if you're familiar with H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and the Call of Cthulhu, the great old ones are basically gods of the primordial world. Before there was even planets and the rest of that stuff, there were these entities. And so, if that's the case, I mean, Cthulhu has been described, and I know it's fiction and all the rest of this from H.P. Lovecraft. But uh, if that's the case here, where there are these primordial gods, uh, why wouldn't they be sort of seeding their, you know, uh, DNA or their spawn into all over all over the universe because you, you would expect right if that's the case then you have worshipers everywhere don't you uh i mean i wouldn't look at it like worshipers i would see it more like like wh what are we doing to our own bodies like in science when we're like trying to cure cancer we're putting like tiny robots in our body that can target little things maybe we're uh Maybe we are like the cleanup of the universe, or I think we have to be anyway. Otherwise, 
otherwise uh we have to figure it out and survive and uh, harness it otherwise we'll perish in it gotcha all right all right i'm with you i'm with you what else you got for us tonight my friend so there's a movie on netflix about like the smartest octopus and it's about a diver who dives every day for like a couple months in the same spot and meets the same octopus and it's on netflix it's called my octopus teacher and uh it's a it's really good at, it's a really good movie Gotcha. Okay. So worth, worth watching. Uh, so cool. Cool. I will check that out when I get get some time. Uh, sweet. So, so, uh, if we're drinking the maybe juice tonight, are you going to call this plausible or nah with the, the, uh, the panspermia octopus theory here in space? Yeah. I think it's very possible. Yeah. I mean, anything's possible. The oceans are pretty, uh, you see how fast we evolved this like in like, just a hundred years. I mean, you look at billions of years. I don't even, I can't even imagine really. Yeah, it is. It is so large of a concept to I kind can't. of wrap your mind around it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, everything's possible given a billion years, isn't it? <laughs> and I think that's, that's probably scientifically, technically true. <laughs> right on, right on. Appreciate it. My friend, uh, Joseph here has a YouTube channel called hydro hose. Check it out, please. You can it just sounds just like it spells H Y D R O H O E S. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. I appreciate the call tonight. All right. Have a great one. Thank you very much. Simple as that. You guys want to be part of the show? 702-957-1037. We're discussing this theory, panspermia. And not just panspermia. We're discussing the fact that these octopi, the cephalopod, was actually seeded here on this earth back in the Cambrian explosion, which of course was a couple hundred million years ago. Uh, some, something to that effect. And they, uh, they say that maybe... The life exploded on this planet because it came through the panspermia process, including, at the time, the cephalopod, which, of course, is the octopus. They're super intelligent. Uh, they, they've escaped from their tanks, again, like uh, Joseph was saying, to maybe jump into another tank to bring fish back into their own tank, not to eat, but for company, to hang out and uh, be bros with the other fish. Seems strange, doesn't it? Love to hear your thoughts. 702-957-1037. How possible do you think this is? All uh, right, let's go to Jennifer in Missouri. Welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Hey. Yeah, I think this is completely possible. You know, if you think about um, just the the way that the oceans and when you hear about the old theories that there's water up in space and people have done, have you ever heard like the water bottle trick? You take a bottle of water, you fill it up with water and uh, you put your hand over the opening of the bottle and you turn it upside down so the opening of the bottle is facing down, the water should pour out, but it doesn't. It has something to do with like a gravitational pull of suction thing occurring. And so the water won't pour out. And if you take like a toothpick and you poke it through the opening of the bottle through the water, it'll float right up to the top. So it kind of imitates like gravity basically. So it creates a firmament, like a, a false firmament kind of a thing. And the old mythos talk about that, that there's water um, above and water below. That doesn't even have to be necessarily true. I mean, what that can insinuate is that maybe the ocean somehow is also the abyss of space. You think about, like, um, the cephalopods and how some of them are bioluminescent. And that occurs because with some of these creatures, because they're exposed continuously to a very a complete darkness. And so they start, it's some kind of, you know, it's a strange phenomenon, but you see that a lot um, with the cephalopods and the oceans and everything. And it comes from deep, deep darkness. The same is kind of like outer space, but that doesn't even have to be that there's water up there. We know that there is. Um, so like the way the earth was made and the way it got its water was from space, you know, and we know that, that the rocks either that smashed together to form the earth had water already in them or that the water was put here from, like you were talking about with the seeding and everything, if that water was frozen and it contained the literal eggs or something of some kind of Cthulhu-like being or that was already from very deep in space and it was carrying them here and it smashed here and then the ice thawed and these eggs somehow, or yeah, I would say something to that effect possibly. And then the, the idea of 
the type of personality of some of these cephalopods, and we don't really even grasp. And, and they're nothing, you know, one more thing, too, that's kind of strange. If you look at the human body without its um, exterior skeleton protecting the nervous system, it looks very strange. It's all tendrils, you know, connected to the brain and the eyes. almost looks itself kind of like a cephalopod does, like an octopus. It's just a bunch of tendrils if you lay it on a table. And so it kind of makes sense. And if you didn't have this shell, you would have to be immersed in a fluid like water if you didn't have the skin and everything. What if this Cthulhu thing, what if they want to, like, somehow get even into me if you want to get really weird with it? I mean, if they were to somehow be able to be in a human host even and experience being on the surface, I mean, we don't know because microscopic hydras and all that stuff. But... I think it's incredibly plausible. I think that the deep outer reaches of space, they even found through NASA, like something about hundreds of trillions more water than is in our oceans, of course, and it's surrounding like a black hole. So like there was something about that on NASA that I saw, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So we know that there is space, waters, that there's, and if you think, oh, another thing too that's really strange with the water out in space is water in deep, not in the deepest of space, but in zero gravity turns into a sphere, a perfect sphere. But this whole thing with the water and the cephalopods being seated that way, that was my point, that it makes perfect sense that this could have happened. And then the idea about Cthulhu, um, primordial gods, yes. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's for sure. <laughs> you know, that it could be something, an alien type of personality, because we don't know they're acting, they're not necessarily acting like people. They have their own who knows what kind of personality we actually don't even know, like, but they obviously have motivations of sorts and we associate it with being kind of like our own. But if you think about like the movie alien and stuff, the way that that kind of worked out. So I mean, who knows, but I like it. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, it, it gets deeper than that too. So, so what we've got you on the phone here, we could take the next step. And if this is some sort of seeding process through the universe, through some sort of a primordial God or being something like Cthulhu, uh, well, what uh, what's happening then? Uh, do we expect to find possibly the octopi all over the galaxy? That's the weirdness here, right? And if that's the case, like you said, if you want to get super weird about it, is that seeding process some sort of control mechanism somehow? You have the octopi on particular planets, and maybe you can somehow control the thought process. We're going to get to that in a sec with the trickster spirit. But uh, any comment on that before uh, <laughs> before we get to that? If the outer reaches of um, space or the abyss are hydrogen, oxygen, H2O, if they're water, and these beings are living in that, and the like a flu, like a almost like amniotic fluid, I think that yes, it could be full of these types of beings that look like the cephalopods we see in our oceans, or you know the the what is it called like the uh, well just like the ocean life. The marine life, that's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> but, like, yeah, so it makes perfect sense. And um, the things that you see in the ocean are so bizarre. I mean, just unbelievable some of the things that are at the bottom of the ocean and the deepest reaches of the oceans. I mean, it's like the stuff of nightmares, honestly. And so I fully think it's, yeah, if the abyss, too, of the ocean somehow, cause we don't really necessarily know. I mean, if you want to get really weird with it, we don't know that somehow the ocean, because the ocean at the bottom of the ocean, it acts very similar to space. It crush, nothing can really go down there. It's really hard to do because everything just crushes in on itself. But what if there's some spots of the ocean that actually don't end in a seafloor at all and somehow wind up being right back in on itself somehow, like the like space or something? Somehow. It's almost impossible to figure out how that would be, but out, so it would make sense, yeah. And and then with the idea of these great, like the Leviathan in the biblical mythos, ah, that's you know, a good it comes one. out of the ocean. In the Norse mythologies, you have the Gorgamander, that gigantic sea serpent thing that's going to eventually destroy the world or something. So we have a lot of references to things coming out of the water and the primordial waters. So it doesn't hurt at all to throw Cthulhu into it and be like, yep, it's coming out of the water, whatever it is, I mean, <laughs> that we're going to be coming in contact with, whether it's... Uh, a great flood or but pe people have always thought that the waters were going to be were always something that transformation would occur from and when that what that equates to humans a lot of times is 
being washed out, <laughs> you know, but hopefully not. Hopefully. But yeah, not. I don't know. I think Cthulhu, octopus, cephalopod, definitely. Why not? Why not? Uh, again, drinking the maybe juice off the rails tonight, Why not? so that's okay. Why the hell For not? Sure. Why the hell not? Uh, so we'll get to yes. this in a sec with the, the scientific theory suggests octopuses are aliens and came to Earth in cryopreserved eggs, which is exactly what we're talking about. We'll get to that and the rest of that in just a sec. Uh, anything else for us while we got you on the phone tonight? Good stuff. Happy birthday tonight, stalker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, shout out to Derek. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jennifer, uh, amazing stuff as always. If you want to give her a follow, please do. Uh, link is in the description. Jennifer has a YouTube channel. Thanks for calling. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye. Have, have a great night. Thank you. There you go. All right. Simple as that. Uh, you want to be a part of the show? Uh, we're having a conversation about panspermia, about the scientific theories uh, that suggest octopi are aliens and came to Earth in cryopreserved eggs. And that's the idea of, uh, yeah, panspermia. And so, of course, the idea beyond that becomes if something out there is seeding these cephalopods, uh, the DNA out into the universe, out into the galaxy, what is that entity that's seeding that DNA, right? It's got to come from somewhere. And it doesn't just jump, right? Like it doesn't just hop onto an asteroid and fly, does it? It seems like it gets put there. It seems like it gets put there, doesn't it? By what? And that's the question here. And that's how this gets even more strange. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Joseph, for the phone calls. Thanks, James, for kicking us off tonight. And what are your thoughts on this? Is this possible? Is this, this is again a scientific thing. They're trying to say that the, that the, the actual octopus, the cephalopod itself is so far different than the rest of the world, than the rest of the DNA uh, on, the, for, on the rest of the whole world, that there's something here. There's something to this, that the something out there has been seeding the universe with these types of creatures. Of course, the cephalopod, the octopus. So I have no idea. Uh, again, back to Cthulhu for a second and Call of Cthulhu and the Lovecraftian mythos. What does it even mean? Is there some entity out there that's kind of seeding the universe with these uh, octopi? For what reason? Like, for instance, let's go. Let's uh, let's say that we get a, a Titan, the Moon Titan, right? We know that there is water, liquid water, on Titan, and uh, we're looking in the next uh, probably ten or twenty years of getting a submarine, like a drone type submarine, to go drop into the into the waters on Titan. And the question is. If that happens, do you expect to see cephalopods on Titan? Imagine some sort of like really large, nasty, like just bizarre alien octopus on or on Titan itself with uh, underneath the water. Or what if it's almost exactly the same as the uh, the uh, the the octopi we have here on Earth? That's that's the that's the the super weird part here. But okay, all right. So as we go now, now this is the thing. So we're going to take this to the next level here. We're going to step on the gas and uh, really, really get the maybe juice flowing. It's like this. So if you have this Cthulhu entity or whatever this happens to be sending out this cephalopod DNA all over the galaxy or even all over the universe, what is it for? Is it for some sort of control mechanism, like I stated, to have their consciousness littered on every sentient planet throughout the galaxy? And if so, why? If so, why? And so we go to Charles Fort. And this is actually back to that article we're referencing here. This is great stuff from Jonathan McCormick. Uh, again, links in the description. You guys can check it out. But it goes a little something like this. We're talking about a space entity, right? Right. Sending out this information for what? The DNA to maybe have sentient beings on planets everywhere to do what? We've talked about remote viewing. We've talked about being able uh, through quantum entanglement, being the spooky action at a distance. Do you think it's some way to be omnipresent on every planet that has any sort of civilization? whatsoever. We're going to get to that and why that makes some sort of sense in the cosmic term. And uh, well, we're going to keep on trucking, considering these things and talking about all the things. If you want to be part of the show tonight, give us a call 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. We're talking about the great old ones. We're talking about Cthulhu. We're talking about panspermia, the DNA of an octopus and you. Don't go anywhere. More Troubled Minds after the break.
Welcome back to Troubled Minds. I'm your host, Michael Strange, and we are streaming on Rockfin, YouTube, DLive, and Twitter, and we're broadcasting live on the Fringe FM. Tonight, we're talking about alien DNA. That's right, you heard me, alien DNA, though not like you think. We're talking about panspermia and the cephalopod and the octopus, super intelligent creatures possibly seeded on this earth back in the Cambrian explosion of life approximately 200 million years ago. Where did this DNA come from? Is it being sent out there into the galaxy by some super powerful octopoid entity? Love to hear your thoughts. 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. And we'll put you on the show. Easy as that. we got a lot to talk about yet because we haven't even got to the trickster spirits and the archons just yet. But we'll get there. We'll get there. So uh, let's go to our good friend Daryl in New York. Daryl. Daryl, Daryl, Daryl. Daryl in New York. Welcome to the show. Test one, two. Are you there? She's on a delay because of uh, just the way the stream works and the delay works. So let's give her a second to... uh, to pop in here. But uh, okay, so if you want to be part of the show, 702-957-1037. And we're talking about alien DNA, cephalopods coming from the, the these uh, cryogenically frozen uh, panspermia process, if you can believe that. What's going on, Daryl? Welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Oh, hi, Michael. This is a great subject. I, I think they're so interesting, these octopus, how they're such chameleons. They could just assimilate into their environments um, but I was I was thinking about Medusa, you know, in the Greek mythology. Um, you know, she had tentacles like out of her head, like like an octopus that worked independently, you know, on her head. You know, and she was pretty cool. I mean, she was uh, had a lot of power and was kind of considered, you know, kind of a ruler in her day. I don't know. She had a lot of power, but. I think there's something tragic about the octopus. Um, Do you know that when they mate, they both die? The male and the female? I don't know if it's all species of them. But um, anyway, that's how they die. I don't know. But they lay so many eggs to, you know, up to 500,000 eggs. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's pretty wild. And if you're if you're going to seed the galaxy with something, then uh, you would expect uh, to maybe... Seed seed it with something that can lay five hundred thousand eggs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah, I think they're fascinating. Um, I was reading, I was listening, or reading something that like these um, scuba divers were in like Antarctica, and they saw these octopus that t- were shape shifting, and they looked like scuba divers. I mean, they, they thought they were aliens, but I think they were octopus. Did you read about that? Uh, I didn't actually. I, I have seen some of the stuff where they, you know, they're talking about the the, oct- the octopus as a alien entity. You know, ancient astronaut theorists say yes, but no, I, I haven't seen that particular instance you're talking about there. Well, I think I don't know. They thought they were looking at some kind of alien uh, life. No wonder we think they're from outer space. I mean, they're so bizarre, but they they actually took on the formation. It looked exactly like the scuba divers with like their tank and everything. You know, that they can create an illusion that would look exactly like a human being, you know? They can shape shift. I mean, they're unbelievable. I think they're so intelligent. You know? Yeah. But they don't even they don't even have like a skeleton. They're totally like jello, you know? Yeah. How could they be so smart and they're just uh, they're not mammals, you know? Yeah. So they uh, no, yeah. no, no skeletal structure and incredibly strong and tough like that. That's the weird part here, right? You can't just uh, stick them with the stick and they're dead, right? They'll kind of form around it and grab it from you. Like that's, that's how like insane, smart and like tough these things are. Yeah. Pretty nuts. Uh, and so, so like Joseph was saying, I'm sure you caught that earlier. He said that uh, he was at an aquarium down there in Florida and they said that a, a, an actual octopus climbed out of its tank to get into another tank to get a fish to bring it back to its own tank to hang out with it not to eat it to hang oh, out with it that's crazy they're yeah. so they're they're brilliant i think they're so smart i mean it's incredible i think they're just the coolest thing in the world i mean that they can absolutely like change color they're such chameleons and then they can even change their shape i, I think they're amazing they're totally amazing you know, but they, they have to stay in the water, you know. They can't walk on land, so. 
Unless, of course, that's the crazy part. So, so they can change their RNA in in an instant to be able to actually uh, maybe do things like that. So, I wonder if they were forced out of the water for some reason, if they could uh, it maybe turn into like little <laughs> walking on the beach sort of things. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Well, well, the water gives them an advantage. You know, they can they can turn into a shape. But once they're on land, that that whole theory is is gone to shit because uh, they don't. You know, they they have the uh, gravity and no bones and no skeleton. So how would they maintain that shape on land? They're almost well, like zero gravity in the water. You know. Yeah, like they'd be just a puddle, puddle of mush on the beach, sort of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Ash has got a, a, a an actual. I saw this article a few days ago. Uh, United Kingdom declares octopi squids are sentient beings. Uh, I, I did see that, and so meaning that uh, they're once they classify them as that, uh, we're not allowed to kill them anymore in, in, in cruel ways. Meaning, meaning we can't cook them alive and things like that. But yeah, I did see that article. Thanks, Ash. That's pretty wild. Right? Oh my God! They cut the squid's faces off. You know, I mean, that's how you cook squid. Yeah, I exactly. mean, it's terrible. You, you just take a scissor and cut their face off, and then you fry them up. You know, they're delicious. I've had, I've eaten octopus. I feel so guilty. You know, I don't know how I can do that, but they are so delicious. Oh, exactly. it's horrible. You eat something so intelligent. You know, I feel terrible, but they are so <laughs> good. Yeah, they're so oh, so good. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, what, what do you think about the, uh, the the Cthulhu stuff? The uh, being seeded from uh, some some extraterrestrial world with uh, uh, some super intelligent uh, version of an octopus somewhere out there. What do you think about that idea? I don't know. I think they're they're not social enough uh, to do any kind of uh, intelligent control or anything. I don't know. I mean, they, they're just loners. Um, they pretty much spend most of their time by themselves. But I don't know. That It sounds like that, that you know, aquarium wasp, uh, octopus wanted company. Maybe they're starting to get more social. Maybe they're, uh, they, I mean, they're very adaptable, you know, that they can uh, adapt and probably change into social creatures. I don't know. But some, some I, heard, I read they live anywhere from, like, two years to maybe 16 years so they don't have longevity on their side either you know which is why you got to crank out a hundred thousand babies super fast that's right, right. that's, right. that's, <laughs> that's that, that the, the r in the k selection theory right that's that's why bunnies yeah. look like crazy and just make a bunch of little little bunnies super fast because uh they're prey that's animals right, right? Yeah. but if you have a short lifespan it would be a similar thing as well yeah great stuff yeah. Uh, what else you got for us daryl i think um i have a lot more but just uh, take another call. I, I just love this subject. I just want to hear more. I love him. I gotcha. love octopus. I, gotcha. I could watch him all day. Okay. Well, we're going to get to the trickster spirit as well. So you're welcome to stay right where you're at. Thank you for the phone call. Appreciate it. Glad you're feeling better. You sound a ton better. Uh, you sound uh, oh. back, to, back to your old self. And it's, 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 it makes me glad to hear it. Thanks for spending your time oh. with us tonight. Thanks for the phone call. Thank you. Pleasure's mine. Uh, go ahead and mute up. You can stay right there and listen. Okay, so yes, uh, the the sound is coming through. So if um, if, if if you do call in on the Discord, just FYI, guys, uh, put it in streamer mode, and those sounds won't come through because those were coming through Daryl's side when you guys were chatting. So that's why that's why they don't come through on mine because uh, it's on streamer mode. But anyway, just a, just a a little Discord hack to keep those beeps from coming through when people chat. But okay, so anyway, what we're talking about tonight is this, right? Scientific theory suggests octopi are aliens and came to Earth in cryopreserved eggs and what we're talking about of course is panspermia the idea that this uh, these these the, the, the dna was seeded somehow throughout the galaxy and of course maybe even the universe if we're talking about billions of years then uh well who is seeding this all right and we've talked about uh remote viewing we've talked about uh uh, the the sense of uh, quantum entanglement, right? Spooky action at a distance, as uh, Einstein has claimed. So what about this? Now, this is a, really like a, taking a bath in some maybe juice. But consider this. What if this super powerful entity, whoever this is, this Cthulhu-like Lovecrafting and old one with the oct- octopoid uh, sort of uh, visage and DNA is seeding these oct- octopi and the cephalopods around the galaxy as a way to maybe remote view in through that quantum entanglement of his own or her own DNA. Uh, meaning, of course, that uh, very much like the Archons, and well, that's why I'm going to bring the Archons into this, that uh, possibly controlling 
sentient life through the seeding of its own DNA. And like I said, would you expect to find uh, maybe on the moon Titan or uh, Enceladus, I think is another one where they say has a actual liquid water there where they have an ocean very deep and they expect to find possibly life in those areas. Would we expect to find in those spaces things like mm, uh, cephalopods, things like these octo- octopi we find on Earth? I don't know, and that's the question, right? So let's say let's so let's again uh, take take another super super hit of maybe juice here, and consider that maybe this entity. All right, again we're saying maybe maybe maybe, and that's fine. That's okay. That's what we do on this show because why not? It makes for a good story, and uh, it makes for some good uh, kind of unlocking your brain and considering the possibilities of the world. But think of it in the, in terms of this. If there's an entity out there spreading its DNA all over the galaxy, what do you think the reason is, right? Other than, of course, you know, just like longevity and, uh, you know, passing on uh, your DNA, just, you know, very much like just people reproducing. But what if this thing is spreading it all over to have some sort of galactic control? Meaning, of course, we're pulling, they're actually pulling strings by having its consciousness buried here through these cephalopods deep inside the ocean. And so it's able to access sort of through, uh, well, uh, that quantum entanglement of its own DNA uh, to maybe access the space here on Earth. And so it doesn't have to travel, again, like I said, like I described, maybe the Lovecraftian old one that might be Cthulhu is actually Sagittarius A, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, center of the Milky Way. But if it's actually sending these things out, DNA-wise, maybe it's a way to be in instant contact with those planets and have some sort of influence because we've determined that it's possible that a cephalopod could have psychic powers, right? Which seems strange with the, uh, again, it, it predicted 85% of the football matches. And it actually, remember, uh, the, the octopus that did this, it took it time in contemplation before choosing which uh, jar to open as they made it pick the, the different things, right? They gave it options. Okay, so then check this out. So what if, right? Now, if we go to the, uh, the Archons, and they have some sort of galactic control, what if, right, let's say in a Cthulhu-like way or like the Archon way, there's some sort of control happening th- uh, to people through, through this cephalopod seeding of the galactic DNA situation in the panspermia stuff. So, all right, so again, some super good maybe juice here. So follow me down this rabbit hole for just a moment then. In many traditions, we're talking about the trickster spirit, all right? We're talking about the archetype of the trickster. And what that means is that, uh, of course, there are people pulling strings. There are people causing mischief. There are, but not people, let's say. We're talking about spirits. And if we talk about spirits, of course, we know that that could mean what? That could mean space poltergeist has been uh, sort of an actual... um, uh, way to, to to kind of demean the subject, uh, but because who knows? Who knows what actually lives in space? I think that's the weird part of this. But let's say that there's some sort of galactic control happening through this seeding of DNA and the quantum entanglement effect that we completely still do not understand. And well, if that's the case, and we have all of these traditions, not just in mythology, different cultures of the trickster spirit. And what does that mean? Well, uh, let's go to this real quick and talk about the trickster spirit and how this could be. Uh, there's animal totems with the trickster spirit. Let's uh, not do that one. Let's see. Um, let's see. Not that one. Hold on. Let me find the right one here. The trickster archetype. And what this means is this. This is from knowyourarchetypes.com. And uh, this is what I'm talking about. So what if very much in the Archon way, this Cthulhu type being is seeding this, this alien DNA in the form of cephalopods or octopi onto not just Earth, but many other planets in the galaxy Th- to through some quantum entanglement, uh, entanglement effect, be able to access this planet with a thought. All right. And if that's the case and we have these again, the archons sort of pulling strings and keeping us under control, we'll get to the archons as well in a sec. But if that's the case, then is it possible that a lot of the shenanigans that have happened with people and with wars and with all kinds of things, if you remember, one of the famous tricksters in Greek mythology actually caused the Trojan War. So 
Well, if you do something like that and you consider the archetype of the trickster, here we go. Uh, the One of the key archetypes of the psyche identified by renowned psychoanalyst Carl Jung, the trickster is a mischievous and often ma- malicious practical joker. Their dubious jokes and deceitful manner can lead to them being assumed to be a purely negative influence, though in reality they can be in fact be loyal allies and challenge individuals to break out of the conventions and rules which society has placed on them. Uh Uh-oh. So what does that mean? Does that mean the ultimate red pill is from Cthulhu and cephalopod DNA? (laughs) to see it through the galaxy oh oh, here we go the trickster archetype and characteristics are like this the trickster is capable of forward thinking strategy planning out future moves to great effect check (laughs) possessing of great intelligence usually more so than would first appear to be the case on the surface the trickster is able to navigate their way through life's challenges using cunning mischief and trickery check The trickster may also have a gift for entertaining others. When in this guise, they are most associated with the clown. Well, I'm not so sure octopi and cephalopods have a a way of uh, tap dancing and entertaining us. But that one, as Joseph described, did climb out of the cage, his own tank, and go into another tank to get the fish and bring it over to hang out with it, right? It, It wanted company. So I don't know. There's a little bit of weirdness happening here. And so not only are we talking about, of course, like the Archon. So what is the Archon? Why am I bringing that into this? In Gnosticism, the Archon well, were malevolent, sadistic beings who controlled the earth, as well as many of the thoughts, feelings, and actions of humans. All right? I'm going to say that again. And this is what I'm getting to, right? And this is where this sort of leads us into this, well, why are they seeding their DNA throughout the galaxy? All right, because of course, we're talking about the Cambrian explosion, where the cephalopod DNA is supposedly supposed to have just appeared on Earth. And so they say that it probably happened through that panspermia effect. All right, but here we go. The Archons were malevolent, sadistic beings who controlled the Earth, as well as, this is where it gets interesting, many of the thoughts, feelings, and actions of humans. And if there's some sort of entity out there, galactic or dimensional entity, doing this, controlling the thoughts, feelings, and actions of humans, why not Cthulhu through DNA seeding and, of course, that would be quantum entanglement and some sort of remote viewing to access what's actually happening on Earth in real time through entanglement, through its own DNA. I don't know. It's just a thought. Howdy, internet people. It's just a thought, if you know who I'm talking about. But I don't know. I think this, uh, once you start kind of uh, pinning it down to this level of WTF, uh, it's a lot of maybe juice. And that's okay. Sometimes you got to have a, uh, have a little fun with it and uh, think in terms of maybe the greater aspect of what could be going on out there. If things like this are happening, clearly we have no freaking idea. And uh, well, that's probably part of why maybe being a human being is so hard. Right? We've talked about that in the past, the human condition, all the, uh, the, the uh, ways we got to twist ourselves in knots just, just to justify our personal takes on the world when, well, the, the world itself seems to be a strange place. And uh, that's what we're talking about tonight. What do you think? What do you think about the trickster spirit archetype? What do you think about maybe this uh, influence of the, the archons through possibly a Cthulhu-like entity that's seeding its DNA throughout the universe and galaxy, of course, in the uh, terms of uh, cephalopod DNA? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> What's up, Race? Race in the chat says, maybe Juice should be the name of this show. And uh, it kind of is. It's, it's the unofficial nickname, I guess. But okay, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What do you think? Uh, considering the Archons, the trickster, uh, the trickster spirit, and that whole um, archetype, and of course, back to the cephalopod seeding of the galaxy through this panspermia effect, do you think there is possibly out there some sort of Cthulhu entity that's maybe making this happen. And i uh, love to hear your thought. we got a few more minutes. If somebody wants to jump in here and get on the phone, 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. And uh, let's go to this trickster thing I want to talk about real quick, too. So we got the trickster archetype. But then we also have, uh, there's, again, all over 
the the uh, the actual um, mythologies of of the world. Basically, we have these these trickster gods and goddesses. This is from LearnReligions.com, and uh, let's go to that one I was talking about. So we have uh, Eris, the Greek goddess Eris, E R. I S a goddess of chaos. Eris is often present in times of discord and strife. She loves to start trouble just for her own sense of amusement. And perhaps one of the best known, known examples of this was a little dust up called the Trojan war. It all started with the weddings of Thetis and Peleus, who would eventually have a son named Achilles. All of the gods of Olympus were invited, including Hera, Aphrodite and Athena. But Eris's name got left off the guest list because everyone knew how much she enjoyed causing a ruckus. Eris, the original wedding crasher, showed up anyway and decided to have a little fun. She tossed a golden apple, the apple of discord, into the crowd and said it was for the most beautiful of the goddesses. Naturally, Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera had to uh, bicker over who was the rightful owner of the apple. Zeus, trying to be helpful, chose a young man named Paris, a prince of the city of Troy, to select a winner. Aphrodite offered Paris a bribe he couldn't resist. Helen, the lovely young wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. Paris selected Aphrodite to receive the apple and thus guaranteed that his hometown would be demolished by the end of the war. And there you go. And there's more here. There's a, there's a whole bunch of trickster spirits. We'll get into some more of this as we go tonight. But uh, I think that's the question. I think uh, if you're trying to weave a cosmic narrative of some gigantic malevolent entity pulling strings for their own amusement, well, maybe Cthulhu is a trickster spirit. Maybe in the trickster archetype, the seeding of the cephalopod DNA is a way to dip into exactly what we're talking about through that quantum entanglement effect, possibly remote viewing, and of course, causing chaos and strife to the human race. So love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, as we finish up, we actually got like a minute left. I see you there, Ash. Hang tight. We'll get to you in just a sec and we'll put you on the show. But I think, I think there's a weirdness to this, right? There's a, there's a super strange bit to this and uh, it's, it is what it is. It's one of those strange things. I think if you can stitch together some of these narratives, and again, this is not me, by the way, uh, shout out to uh, Night Stalker again, Derek in Massachusetts. Happy birthday to him. Happy belated. He was uh, turned 32 years old yesterday. Thank you, Derek, for, uh, for uh, participating in the show and uh, sharing this amazing article. But this is from Jonathan McCormack, and he wrote this article, sort of, uh, again, loose association, stitching this stuff together and uh, considering that, well, maybe, maybe. Are we being controlled by a super intelligent psychic alien octopus from the future? Yeah. Scientifically speaking, he says, yes. And I'm going to leave it with that and say, also, ancient astronaut theorists say yes. (laughs) And as we finish, as we wrap this up, you guys know how this goes. It's a little something like this. If you're listening to us on the Fringe FM, stay tuned for Joe Roop lighting the void. If you're listening to us on any other platform, including the podcast feed, stay tuned for a third hour of Troubled Minds. We're going to keep talking about the trickster spirit. We're going to talk about, of course, the Archons. We're going to talk about this Cthulhu entity seeding the cephalopod DNA throughout the galaxy. What do you think? Oh, boy. Thanks for listening, guys. As we finish, be sure, be strong, be true. Thank you for listening. From our troubled minds to yours, have a great night. Michael Strange here. This is Troubled Minds. We're just hanging out. 
talking about all kinds of weird stuff. And so as we get into the third hour, you guys know the drill. We're going to take a quick two-minute break here, and we'll be back with more of this. But what do you think? Do you think there's something to this, or do you think we've, we've done it this time? Damn it, Michael, you've done it this time. We are way off the rails here. Well, you can blame Derek in Massachusetts. I think it's an amazing article, though, how we started, and it's just kind of doing the free association. And, well, maybe this, then maybe that, and maybe why not? And, well, here we are. We're going to get to trickster spirits. We're going to get to that archetype. We're going to get to archons, of course, and how maybe it fits into this, because there's more to say about that. And what do you think regarding panspermia and cephalopods being sent out through the galaxy? Mm, what does it mean? What does it mean? More trouble lines on the way. Two minute break. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. We got Ash the Reptilian here. Not sure if he's going to jump in, but you're more than welcome to, my friend. Be right back. More trouble minds on the way. Two minute break. Here we go. All right, welcome back to Troubled Minds. I'm your host, Michael Strange, and we're here talking about Cthulhu. That's right, Cthulhu. And not just a Lovecraftian mythos Cthulhu, but also what about the cephalopods being seeded throughout the galaxy? Uh, some have speculated that the panspermia effect brought cephalopods and the octopi, octopus, to, to Earth about 200 million years ago in the Cambrian area epoch which of course means that there was an explosion of life and they don't think it came from evolutionary uh standards instead they think that it actually came into uh onto earth through some sort of uh seeding a uh, galactic seeding process, again, panspermia. And so the question is, right, if the cephalopod and the octopus came to Earth approximately 200 million years ago, what exactly was seeding their DNA elsewhere? And that's the thing that makes me go, hmm, there's got to be something out there that was super old, even primordial to the universe, that was possibly dropping these things all over the galaxy. So what was that entity? Is it something like Cthulhu? Is it something like exactly what we're doing here? And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Derek's got it right. The Night Stalker, like a giant cosmic primordial Johnny Appleseed with tentacles. <laughs> exactly. That's a good way to put it. Uh, we, got, uh, we got our good buddy Ash here. Uh, Ash, the reptilian from Mars, test one, two. Are you there, buddy? Are you there? Hey, can What's you up? guys hear me? Loud and clear, loud and clear. Our uplink oh. to Mars is hot and piping today. What's up, my friend? How are you? How are you guys doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, a, little, a little under the weather, but I'm recovering. Oh, I have no. a Mars Corona. Did they, did, cor- they, did they get the mars Corona variant on Mars? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's mutated that I can, you know, spread off planet. So, um... You know, we didn't clear, <laughs> cut, close the Mars border, so unfortunately, you know, now it's here. Oh, it's boy. spreading, so. That's I'm on my 35th booster, um, <laughs> you know. Well, I just find stuff out in the Martian soil and just eat it, and I just, <laughs> uh, you know, I figure it, it's good I, enough. I think you know. you're going to be fine, then. I think you're going to be fine. Uh, so, yeah, so, I'm going to make a full recovery. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you're, uh, you're, you're uh, at least not laid out. That's, uh, that would be the bad thing. Uh, so, so I don't know. We're talking about, I don't know how much of the show you caught before you popped in here, but uh, what about the cephalopod being seeded from some sort of galactic entity uh, through that panspermia process? You think we're way off the rails tonight? Man, you know what? <sighs> And, and and I think you guys can attest to this is that you kind of think it's going to be one way when you get into this kind of stuff, you know, and then you start digging and it gets weird. <laughs> you know, you see, you hear some weird stories. So what is reality? And uh, we don't really know. We really, really don't. Um, you know, I just listened to a bunch of stories of uh, near death experiences and after death experiences and a super commonality is the people being able to see themselves and hovering above themselves. And so I like to use the example of remote viewing and after death because it breaks our paradigm of what we understand as reality and what's potentially possible. So is there like entities on the other side? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if the soul exists, then there must be other kind of souls, right? 
we don't really know. And um, I think the air, the arrogance of man is to just uh, assume our tools are good enough and that we'll, we're figuring it out. But I think a lot of the weirder stuff that, that the mind breaking stuff is kind of kept away from us. And, you know, if a, if a, of 11 foot mantis comes in through your wall, through a portal and talks to you through telepathy. I mean, there's so many things there that just don't make any sense. Right. But these are the kind of stories we hear. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good topic because, uh, you know, first off octopus octopi are pretty cool. They're pretty dope. Um, they have a uh, fun fact. They have a brain in each arm. They're the only animal I believe to even have a second brain let alone one in each arm. So it's almost like they're an engineered organism to to some degree, or, or they have evolved uh, on a different parallel from, from our biological life. Cause you, at least you would, you should see something else with that sort of like system, right? You know, like look at venom, Uh, venom is in snakes. It's in scorpions. It's all over the place, but uh, you don't, you don't see like, you know, trees with brains in their stems or it just doesn't, it's just a weird, weird creature. And they are super intelligent. Um, like I linked earlier, they're sentient enough that, you know, we shouldn't be just eating them alive now. Um, but I mean, I'm sure they still will, (laughs) but, uh, in some places of the world, but, but yeah, they're, they're really freaking cool creature. And, um, uh, these remote viewer, he was remote viewing, I was watching this episode on Farsight and I I, I bring him up because there's a lot of interesting little moments that happen. One of the moments is he accidentally remote viewed like this, like alien colony. And, uh, he like got the sense that what they did for fun was they engineered creatures and tried to make the most like ridiculous creatures, but make them stable, make them in a way that like, um, you know, make it, put it, put it on their garden, the earth, and then see if it, it, it'll stick. It'll actually survive and like reproduce. And, um, I don't know. I just always felt like the octopus was some guy like popping off, man. He like, God, nay, <laughs> such a, it's such a crazy <laughs> creature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, I think that's the thing too, is that it's with all of that weird DNA, DNA stuff. And, you know, they're super, super smart. We were talking about this tonight and the fact that they can actually change their RNA in a moment at a moment's notice for whatever they need. Right. We've seen their camouflage abilities. Uh, Joseph called in and said he was at an aquarium in uh, Florida. And w- one of them actually climbed out of its tank to go get into another tank to get a fish to bring it back to his tank to hang out with it because they feed it. So it wasn't hungry. It wanted to hang out with this fish, I guess. <laughs> so, like, what, what the hell's going on with that? Yeah, it's it's strange. It's a strange creature. Um, you know, I think it's got ink. It's got a beak. It's it's capable of problem solving. And I always I always wondered. Um, you know, uh, they say those gray aliens are like robots, bio robots, and they have like a weird, almost like blue kind of like flesh to them and they got big eyes. I always wondered like, you know, um, if there's, if this, if they use the same tech in, in both creatures in the, in the, in the octopus and, uh, in the gray, I don't know, just like a a random thought, but it is, it is a weird, it's a weird thing, man. Um, there is a, yeah, they have a brain in each arm. I had some notes here. I'm just going through genetic seeding. Yeah. The, the, the genetic seeding, um, the trans, transpermia is the idea that um it's probability wise it's probably more common that life can spread from one planet to the next than just manifest from nothing right all you got to do is manifest from once like something like once like 10 billion years ago and it's going to spread all over the place so that's statistically more probable well you know it doesn't mean that life couldn't come you know, germinate again, right? And maybe that is some of the life here on this planet. It's so strange. You know, I look at some creatures and I'm just like, man, that that is on purpose. You know, like the scorpion, like, what the heck? Like, how did that evolve? Like, it just had like a thing sticking out of its side? And then it was like, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have poison in it now? I mean, there's a bombardier beetle that literally, like, 
it's like a dragon. It like it like mixes fluids and blows up, and it, it like can cause a lot of damage. It's like a rocket. It's like how how tell explain to me how that would naturally evolve. Explain to me. It just starts producing one fluid, and then like. What well, picks up the other fluid and starts walking around with it until it, like it doesn't make it like like our science is I think it's one of the biggest problems right now is that our science is dumb like our science is supposed to be smart and like evolution and this and that but I think it's actually dumb like like it lacks common sense like the bombardier beetle or I don't know like uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of species like that so. Where the heck did the octopus come from? And, you know, it's a prime example. It's just so out there. Um, Yeah. And it's like, if it evolved with all these features, why didn't other things evolve like that? I mean, it's pretty effective, right? Like, it's a pretty effective creature. There's a phenomenon in nature where uh, creatures became social, like wolves and humans, and creatures with social hierarchies are, were way more successful than their competitors. Well, the octopus didn't care. The octopus was such an amazing creature. It didn't need to become social. Not really. So, like, why didn't... <laughs> where's the other... Where's the, where's the other weird octopus creatures? You know? Where's the, like, wolf with, like, tentacles coming off its face? You know, I just... I don't, I don't know. I just, um... You know, maybe I'm just crazy, but these are just thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you how dare you uh, the thoughts from mars uh well at, at least the uh the the the, the mars Akron variant is under control it seems like you've uh you've handled that and uh well that's good uh, i'm glad to hear that it's handled and you're doing well and all the rest of that um so we're going to keep talking about this of course and we'll get to the archons and uh the trickster uh the trickster archetype and uh is that what's going on here is this actually the craziness of well if we're seeding dna from maybe some primordial entity uh well and why are they cephalopods why are they these octopi because if they were they are if they are then is it uh for a particular reason other than just um, sort of like spreading that information out or is it uh some other some other version of uh maybe control maybe sort of a galactic control that's kind of what i'm looking at here but uh good stuff uh, we got night stalker we're going to bring him in but uh, you're welcome to stay ash don't go anywhere if you if you got some time completely up to you of course uh, amazing takes as always let's go to uh, derek Derek in Massachusetts. What's up, my friend? You're on Trouble Minds with Mike and Ash. What's happening? Going on, Brutus. What's happening? Great uh, show. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is yours. This is this is this is your baby, man. You you linked that one, and I was like, oh, how could I pass up space octopus from the future? <laughs> <laughs> I was honestly figuring it was it was too much maybe juice, but I I should have known. You know, it's just 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 the right amount. Just the right amount. Hey, man, we're not scared to bathe in the maybe juice. It's all good. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts um, on, on this panspermia stuff and the rest of it, right? Do you think there is uh, maybe a link here with the Archons and that trickster spirit that maybe uh, it, this all traces back to Cthulhu or something? Oh, yeah, for sure. It definitely could. I mean, as far as uh, like panspermia and stuff, I know in Lovecraft, with Cthulhu, they have the uh, outer gods and like the elder things, which are these primordial aliens and stuff from, from space, and they see Earth like at the Mountains of Madness with these like space spores and stuff that come down and they create these like black goo monsters and stuff. And they, it's a very like Lovecraftian version of ancient aliens. So if there's some type of like outer God, ancient cosmic alien DNA that's being spread all across the, all across the cosmos landing on planets and, and uh, spawning life, maybe all life is from that or maybe just octopus sprawled up from that or I don't know, but I had a thought while, I, while you were talking, um, there was an article from I think I posted it uh, like an hour and a half ago, probably in the chat, uh, from the conversation about like can octopuses like keep evolving past humanity? Basically, like what if something happened to us? Would the would the octopus still survive? Like still survive and keep evolving? Or what if like nothing happened to us and they just evolved side by side with us? Would they eventually like overtake us and dominate this planet? And like what if that's happened elsewhere? And what if we're dealing with like these? sentient versions of octopus that just that lived on planets with their own humanoid species and just they were the dominant one they they beat them you know like we we invent the technology first but what if they get there eventually too and like the scary thought as far as this like what if some type of psychic octopus is running the universe what if instead of humanity we always talk about 
an ancient AI or an advanced cosmic AI that maybe a, a different race of humans built. Maybe we didn't build it. Maybe an octopus built it, and it's some kind of crazy AI octopus that's at the center of the universe with its tentacles all metaphorically all over the galaxy, you know? And that's the, that's the thing that's, like, sending out these spores or these panspermic waves, like, all across the universe and building life from that. Maybe that's the thing that's trying to build this technology that we talk about all the time. Maybe instead of being some AI from us, it's an AI from a sentient octopus race. How's that for maybe juice? That's pretty wild. And think of it in terms of this, right? Like, like I keep saying, if I have to pin me down and say, what exactly is Cthulhu? I, I keep pointing to Sagittarius A, right? As the supermassive black yeah. hole at the center of the galaxy. But also notably, galaxies have arms like an octopus. I know, don't they? I know, I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, so it makes you wonder, you know? And if it is like, what, like we, like science always talks about, or not science, I mean like, weird sci-fi astronomy always talks about are is a humanoid shape like the basic shape there's another article that was aggregated earlier this week about how is like a humanoid the most efficient thing in the in the universe like do we keep popping up on other planets because that's just how evolution works but are we more efficient than the octopus or is that just a human mindset are we saying that from the year 2021 where we're the top dog but maybe in the year 3021 they I don't know, they overtake us somehow. And like an octopus might be wooden eight arms and eight brains and they can escape all kinds of stuff. They seem like they're not talking to us, so we don't think they're as smart as us. But in a lot of ways, they're pretty pretty crafty, you know? Like, they're smart. So what if they, in some other parallel world, they're, they're the ones that created technology instead of us. They would they'd dominate us in a, in a second. It wouldn't even be close, you know? Yeah, so. well, and, and in terms of like intelligence too, like we're you know we're we're Elon Musk is talking about going to Mars, right, and saying that we we have to be a planetary species if we're going to survive. So the ultimate yeah. way to survive, of course, would be not just become a planetary species, become like a galactic species. And yeah. so the way to do that is exactly what we're talking about, right? You you just see the DNA all over rocks and things that are just flying all over the place and maybe just give them a push from the center. Maybe that's the stuff exactly. that's going on from there, from that center of the, the Milky Way, whatever that supermassive black hole is, it, there's some sort of process happening there where this DNA gets seeded and pushed. And then exactly. that stuff just yeah. flies out and here we are. Welcome cephalopods to the Cambrian <laughs> explosion 200 million years ago. And well... Uh, it's, uh, what do they say? Truth is stranger than fiction, is it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I think is happening. That's if you had to twist my arm and say like, what's, what's creating life around the universe. That's kind of what I think it is. It's, it's probably some advanced mind of some sort, some AI or something that's like not worried about time. So maybe some, some trickster entity or something that's like just seeding out weight. They've, they've seeded out the building blocks of life in some mass panspermia wave so like that we've they've like pollinated the earth ready for 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 growth and then every thousand years ten thousand years hundred thousand years they just keep sending out these waves of spores and stuff and they talk about in all kinds of different like in regular human history they talk about the stone ape theory in terence mckenna and how like maybe the jump from from chimp to, to man was this was they got into the mushrooms, you know, that's a, some spore. All it would take was just this cosmic mind to send out these spores and boost the intelligence of life on all these planets. And then they send out more spores and more ideas and how many Silicon Valley tech elites say that they get ideas from psychedelics and stuff to build technology. And what if it's all again from this cosmic mind just nudging along these little test tube planets they've created with this like primitive life to see which one creates this technology or all of them or whatever, just again, to build the other side of the Stargate that they turn on. And then they're, they're now here. They've, they've, they've invaded us. They, and they're now we've, we've assimilated into that collective mind. Once we turn on our, our advanced super AI and stuff. And we've just assumed that some other human is the one that created it, you know, but I don't know, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that we're just too early in the process. And then eventually the octopus will overtake us or what if we just like get fried somehow or atlanta style we destroy ourselves and the octopus keeps evolving and they're the ones that pick up our technology instead like i always think what would happen if like we we get destroyed so it's got it went from like dinosaurs what if there was like advanced what if dinosaurs are a little more advanced than we thought and then we kind of pick up the pieces like, like humanity and stuff and what if a million years from now i used to always think what if it's like 
bugs or something and some kind of mantis and that's where like mantis races come from and that kind of stuff but an octopus is probably even more likely you know especially if they have the cover of uh the oceans i don't know i'm really rambling but there's a lot of uh maybe juice in the pile tonight you know? i'm loving <laughs> you're it good you're, you know you're right there's no rambling here. there's no rambling here <laughs> yeah yeah you're good you're good man you're good no I, I think that's that's weird that's that's why this is also strange because you know, it, it again, it, it does kind of strike at the heart of what we are, where we came from, right? Like, like yeah. in, in terms of like, you can say the cephalopod, they, you know, they, they've had scientists really say that this is, this is alien DNA as far as the earth is concerned. And so yeah. it kind of makes you wonder about us. And again, our place in the universe and all the rest of this, it's amazing stuff. And it, it's, it's okay, right? It's, it's okay to like, kind of just go way deeper than anybody out there and just consider this. I, I don't know where you found this article. Cause it, I thought this guy was like super popular. Something says he has like, you know, 150. No, I'm not sure. This, 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 this was posted in the, uh, in the secret sun Facebook group. Okay. One of the uh, people posted. So I'm not sure where they got, I'm not sure where they got it from. Probably they probably know the guy I, w- I would assume. Yeah. Yeah, um, pretty wild. Anyway, to, to it's kinda, cool stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the loose association stuff. It's uh, you know, from from uh, from one to the next to the next to the next, right? But clearly, yeah. we do that stuff all the time. But man, this this is this is wild. We're talking about the the space octopus from the future. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I mean, in, as, as far as uh, there was um, anybody who watched Marvel's What If? This is not really a spoiler, but the last like two episodes was about what if Ultron like dominated the universe. We talked about this before, but like it just keeps um kind of becoming more advanced and like taking out more tiers of like society and like essentially just becoming it becomes like the mind of the universe and it's just what if or what if even more even more simply what if you get some kind of advanced octopus sentient cephalopod type race that just events time travel and they've just decided to Inter- like interact with us in that capacity that they oh earlier in our evolution there was a time where there was an advanced race of like these chimp people that would dominate the planet i wonder what would happen to our trajectory if we like interfered with them you know like what if we found out that there was some type of lizard advanced lizard race we create time travel and we go back to when there was like king cooper and the reptilian royalty running running the planet you know I would, i'm sure we would i'm not sure that's that's some crazy stuff i'm talking about oh so i'll go but uh Wild, wild, wild stuff, Mike. Really, really, really cool stuff. <laughs> Thanks for sharing it. Uh, always, <laughs> always good stuff. Uh, happy, happy belated birthday to you, my friend. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, brother. Thanks for thank being you, you and uh, amazing, amazing stuff as always. Ash had a take real quick. I don't know if you want to talk to you. Do you have to go? I don't have to go. No, no. Okay. Hang, I was hang, really rambling. So. No, you're good. Okay. You're good. Hang on for one sec. Ash said he had a take here. Uh, what's up, Ash? Okay. What's up? Hey, what's up, man? I was just, hey, brother. Uh, I was just vibing off what you were saying. It was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> yes. It's you know what it's 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 it gets like you get done and you're like man do I sound crazy but like I know, what I know. you know what what is crazy like we don't we don't, <laughs> we don't know and like you know there's that feeling that 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 God feeling you know where we're all kind of connected I know a lot of in religions in the woo circles kind of like the new edge kind of stuff there's this idea that we're all connected we're all kind of one entity. Yeah. anyway right and um a lot of people near death experiences they go and they talk to god and this entity and um but how does that all work we don't we don't know right there's something yeah. there it, it's see it's we it works and we just don't understand it period that's all you know what i mean anything yeah. in between is magic but it, it is re- reality it it has rules it has there's a system there and so for like us to all be of this thing this entity I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like, if something had the potential to to like spread uh, quickly throughout the galaxy and the universe, it's already done so, and we are within that framework that that entity already, yeah. and maybe that explains that consciousness, that connection between us all. And dude, there's like, there's definitely like entities trying to push humanity in different directions. Like, that's yeah, for sure. I mean, like, and once you dig in it, you start to see the evidence, and it's like. Well, is there a, like an entity beyond that, the Cthulhu, like, you know, exactly. that's trying to, and, and it's like, is it just dropping all these different consciousnesses all over the galaxy, integrating with them and becoming like this omnipotent God creature constantly evolving, getting more powerful and uh, more efficient and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's wild. And you, and you mentioned like the arms of the galaxy. It's, it's wild. It's like, you know, if there's life throughout the whole galaxy, then, you know, you know, your, your atoms uh, have a ton of space between them, the protons and the electrons, and we yeah. consider that a thing. 
So, you know, if you have a solar system and there's life all over it, can't you still consider that a thing as well? It's kind of like yeah. the same thing, right? So, except now there's kind of this living biome across of it. So, if you extrapolate, you know, if it's on all the galaxies, <laughs> it's on, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, yeah. it's, it's, it's a wild thought. And maybe different galaxies are different octopus entities. Maybe they're different biomes or, or, or who, who knows, man. But exactly. so I mean, it, you, even like the uh, fractal, like you see like pictures on Facebook and stuff showing like how the, uh, the universe is like the is like the neurons firing or how like different different galaxies look like look like eyes or like fingerprints and stuff and like and as, a, as an illustration that as above so below kind of all fractally connected but what if it's not like a human eye and what if it's an octopus instead if if these galaxies there's a lot more nebulas and like weird space clouds that look like octopuses than there are that look like humans you know so what if yeah. what if the what if the shape of consciousness is actually an octopus <laughs> you know you know what i heard this I heard this thing where it's like um, scientists were getting frustrated because like, I don't know exactly the context. I don't know, but everything just kept evolving into crabs. That was like a (laughs) thing. It's like, if you look, if you look at all these evolutions, I think it's like all the evolution paths of all these different creatures, you go back, it's like the freaking crab. And it's like, in these different areas, things just kept turning into crabs. So I think it's funny. It's like, maybe, maybe in a vacuum of space with the Taurus pattern, I don't know if you guys know, are familiar with that whole thing the torus no, no, it's, it's like it's like when things get pulled into itself it also oh, torsion okay yeah, like yeah. torsion yeah 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 through the center and then out and then back in and it's like this pattern and if you look at it every level of reality at the microscopic at the universe level you know at your sink it's all yeah. it's just yeah. this field super yeah. common and it, you you could like I could see the octopus in it though. Like, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you're definitely. me out, making me go nuts. Sure. Ah. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where we're going, we don't need rails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> for sure, hundred uh, percent. Anything else first, Derek? You're the best brother. No, no, that's it. But I really, really awesome stuff, you guys. Fun uh, yeah. show. Uh, thanks, thanks for inspiring it. You're the best man. Catch you later. Thank you, later. Have a great one. There you go. There you go. Uh, Derek in Massachusetts. Appreciate that very much. Uh, thanks thanks for uh, popping in and chiming in, Ash, as well. Uh, good stuff. So we're still talking about this, guys. If you want to be part of the show, uh, discussing, well, this whole, um, uh, what is this? It's a, it's a, uh, panspermia, right? It's, it's the cephalopods. It's these bizarre octopi that are doing whatever it is they're doing. I don't know. There's, uh, there's some strangeness to this. Is there some uh, maybe entity that's pulling the galactic strings? Uh, maybe not just through the galaxy, but through the universe? I don't know. I think the question is still valid and open, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. 702-957-1037. That's 702-957-1037. We'll get to the trickster, trickster spirits and some more archons in a little bit here to maybe tie this whole thing together. But uh, you tell me. You tell me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, speaking of uh, great thoughts and amazing stuff, let's go to Kelly. Kelly in Colorado. What's up, my man? Welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Good evening. How you doing? Ah, a okay. I thought uh, it'd be hard to uh, kind of outdo some of the weirdness we've had this week, but why not? Let's just uh, outdo it all and talk about Cthulhu <laughs> and, and panspermia. <laughs> what do you think, my friend? Oh, man, this is crazy. <clears throat> um, my idea would probably be like Prometheus. You know, have you seen that movie? I haven't, no. you never seen Prometheus? It, it was like a prequel to Aliens. Nope. No, what it was, it was you know, Aliens. The movie Aliens, right, back in the 70s with uh, Sigourney Weaver. Well, what made those creatures was these other like, scientists. I don't know if I feel it for you, but like... You're, uh, they were, you're, you're speaking they would, out again. We, we can kind of not hear you. It's like a robotic or something. You come, come through weird. Oh. Test one, two. Are you there? Michael, what about now? Better, much better, much better. All right, go right ahead. Prometheus. Like I was saying, you know, Prometheus, right? And there were these scientists, and they were, they had all different type of creatures in these jars. And you would just, they would let them out, you know what I mean? And, and through the micro level. But the one, when they would come to this plant, like the one in the movie, beginning of the movie, one of them would have to uh, sacrifice himself. He would drink this, this elixir, and then he, he would, his whole body, 
all the way down, like I said, to the molecular level, like spread out through the waters of the of the planet, which gave everything life. So that's what kind of reminds me of this, what we're talking about now. But uh, there's another, speaking of like the octopus one, you know, and that was a good uh, take on like the... Uh, the universes out there or the galaxies that have arms, you know, they're like an octopus. But um, there's the, another movie from uh, in Hollywood because we all know like Hollywood kind of gives us a little little tidbits of what they know, you know, some of these uh, uh, directors and stuff. But there's one that's called Arrival. I don't know if you've seen that one. I think I've seen that they, one. Uh, and they're, they're like octopus, you know, type things, and, you know, behind a glass in some kind of liquid. But for me, I think that would be actually, if you had a scientist group like that and you're spreading life around like the, the movie Prometheus, you know, you, you that would be more or less deep space travel. So you would have, you know, a creature that would be doing that. An octopus would be perfect, I think. Something like an octopus or an octopi type creature, right? Because number one, you can just put it in a water Kind of like you, you know, some of the waters, like in other movies, like uh, the the movie Abyss, where the Navy SEALs had that they were lit, uh, breathing that pink fluid, and they had more oxygen in it. Yep, I remember that. So, if you, and if you had a creature that could, you know, be if you know suspended in some kind of a liquid like that, no bones, you don't have to worry about you know the shape of the bones, so you might as well just get rid of the bones. Right, you just have like a uh, it's all it's all uh, muscle and tissue like an octopus, and then you know send them out into deep space. They're they're highly intelligent creatures. Oh yeah, those those creatures are very intelligent. But if you send those ones out into deep space, that would be prime, I would say, because you know again you, you know the the body uh, type of of the creature would be perfect for space, and uh, you know. And actually, space has a you know has a lot of uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of water in space, you know, because you know you have like uh, the stars, you know, stars are just um, hydrogen, right? They're just pure hydrogen, and and um, there was actually uh, that physicist uh, Harmin, he was talking about. There's that one video where it looks like he was talking actually. Then that video he talked about space or like Earth size uh, craft that go inside inside the are using the sun as a jump gate. But he was saying that the Soho, uh, you know, the Soho uh, satellite, you know, they test all kinds of stuff. And what the, you know, some of the stuff that's coming off of the, off the earth or off the sun is, is water because it's hydrogen. And, and it's pretty interesting if you use, you know, there's a lot of watery planets and everything. We're not the only ones, of course. Uh, you know, they're actually, detecting a lot of that stuff now but again if you have uh you know if you have a creature like that i'd say yeah to be perfect a perfect one to go around spreading the fever deep space is what it is. because even though you can like jump through space you know in time and you know get to another galaxy or you know pretty fast uh, there's a lot of planets there man and if you're seeding you know galaxies that's going to take uh, quite some time whether you can jump gate or not. Exactly, exactly. And I think uh, that's that's uh, sort of what I was saying earlier as well, that it, it seems like that life is going to be had, you know, not on a place like Mars where it's dry and barren, they tell us. Well, now now they say there's <laughs> underwater, uh, underground water and all the rest of this and frozen water in the poles and all that. But, but anyway, you, know, you, you would expect like uh, this panspermia thing to hit these ocean worlds, again, like Enceladus or Titan, uh, you know, moons, things like this, uh, planets like Earth with tons of water. And it would be, it would be the perfect thing because it can, right? It can survive like a, a, the, uh, the cephalopod can survive the tons of pressure, right? It can, they can hide, they got the ink thing, they can, uh, you know, the whole bit of uh, camouflage like we were talking about last night. Isn't that pretty wild that you, were, you brought that up last night, the camouflage and the octopus, how you snap your fingers and they can just change color to match the background. I mean, that's, that tells you a whole lot about that species right then and there. It's, it's a survivor, and it's, a, it's, it's without bones, but it's also very tough, strong, and smart. And then they're bringing it up in the chat. The, it has a beak. <laughs> like that's like, it's terrifying. I mean, the thing is, uh, 
it's definitely a survivor, but if you're going to be seeding things on the planet, surely you do. it would be something like that and not like a goldfish, right? I mean... <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, again, like you're saying, you know, it does have a beak, so that thing, it's a weird creature, too, like just the blood, everything about it, too, you know. They showed one, you know, you, I've seen, I don't know, a lot of people are talking about it. They, you had, you know, they put one in a jar, you know, and it found out that, you know, it, to escape, it could just unscrew the lid from the inside, you know. They're very intelligent, so if they just, you know, they can just sit there and watch people, you know, from, you know, in a tank or something and know how to. They they crawl out of tanks all the time. Like I had a buddy that had one, and he always said he lost that shit, and it was on the carpet. One time he did it was all. <laughs> but yeah, those those things are crazy. Because another one would be like you know, there's they could squeeze the whole body. I seen one where it was huge. You know, it fell out of the you know onto the boat, right? And and it just slid through the little hole on the side, right? There, yeah. I mean, for me, that would be one hell of a creature. To use, you know what I'm saying? Because you know, and they can handle the deep pressures, you know, deep space. You know, they're in the like the deepest parts of the ocean where it's dark. You know, they can light it up with their own blood. Yeah, but shit, man, those things are all over the place. Are there? Yeah, there's even you know, I've seen a lot of science who talk about this. They believe like you're, you know, you guys were talking, uh, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what the weird thing is too. So so this this is where it gets bizarre. This is why when you when you take what we know about uh they say that it may have come from this panspermia effect, okay? These these cephalopods, the octopus on earth. But if that's the case, once again, we're talking, you know, 200 million years ago this possibly happened. Where did that DNA come from? If it's an aquatic species, right? It's not like putting its DNA on rocks and shooting them into space. It's an aquatic species, right? So what's doing it? Like there's, that's the weirdness here because rocks don't just fly out of the ocean with octopi on them and fly out into space. You know what I mean? So, so what is that process? What's actually happening here? That's the weirdness. Like if you trace it back a billion years, where did this come from? That's the craziest part, right? Yeah, there's a, You'd have to go down to like a lot of pantheons of about, you know, they're talking about water gods, you know, like the Greek, uh, Greek god, what is he was from the ocean and stuff. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. But, Poseidon. And then you have Poseidon, right? And there's other ones too, even you know, Sumerian, uh, the Sumerian ones that had like Inki. He was, for example, he was, uh, besides he was the uh, like lord of the earth, but he was also the, well, they call him, I think, Lord of Waters, too. And there's, a, like, a lot of his his carvings on him. It shows, like, water and fish. You know, he's standing there, but it's, like, uh, like water, like a waterfall or something, and there's, like, fish, and, you know, sometimes there's fish, sometimes there's not, but it looks like water where he's coming either jumping out of the water or something like that. But it's interesting, too, because if you... Like we were talking, you know, you know, we, most of the time we were talking about, you know, cause there's underwater UFOs as well. And if you, you know, if these creatures were here or something like that, or it, maybe that they were pets or and out spies or to check stuff out, you know what I mean? But, uh, or even like a sign, you know, just be like, you know, anything that you do, like a sign. But, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're cutting out again. Out. I'm not sure what's going on, but you're cutting out again, my man. I'm sorry about that. Um, do what about that? Better, better, better. Okay. You're, yeah, just you know, you could use that. Uh, you know, you could use that creature, send it out anywhere. You know, like especially here in the water. But again, I, for me, I don't know, man. I've always think of water as not only life, you know, life giving and everything, but you could use it. You even space, you could use water. They say it freezes, but you could still hold it in a you know in a different temperature within a ship or something. But yeah, waters can be used instead of you know. I I won't go down that one. That's a whole different. That's a whole different one. <laughs> that's all right. That's that's why we're here, man. Uh, rabbit holes and rabbit holes. And I, and it, I you know I think I think that once again the the whole you know truth is stranger than fiction sort of thing because it is just like I was saying uh, just previous there. Where did it come from? 
I mean, that, it, it seems absurd. It, it almost seems like, like we're describing, it's kind of like the perfect entity to just seed all over the universe because they can, once, once they find these water, water-like planets, these water worlds, they just get in there and they just live. But what, to what purpose, to what end, right? Uh, something created that at some point, uh, whether it was like the, the first original you know, galactic evolution or whatever the hell it was. But then again, like I said, they don't jump out of the ocean and send rocks into space. So, so what did? Something did at some point, right? And I think that's the bizarre part here. And so not only that, though, they, they say that the, it, it has stopped traditional, uh, the cephalopod has, has stopped traditional um, evolution. Uh, because it, it can change its RNA in a flash as it needs it. And that's the weirdness of this is because it, it has stayed uh, stable uh, for, for a very, very long time in its genetic code. And that tells you a lot about what this thing may be. It does, maybe it's, it's in its like pinnacle of evolved form for what it needs to be. And so that means what? I mean, that thing, they're super intelligent, like we said. It's got all those bizarre traits, the beak, and it's, it has no bones. And it can, like you said, slip through these tiny holes. They climb out of their tanks. I mean, there's a lot of weird shit here. And, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I have no idea. There was one time I even ran across. I don't know if it was an octopus or if it was like a squid type creature. We could, you know, they're kind of similar, but... Um, I, I ran across where they were saying that I believe it was an octopus. I believe, I don't know, man, it could be either one, but either, either way they could, um, there's one that's the, and it's, it's, it's eternal. So what it does is like it even shrinks itself or like it gives rebirth to itself. Right. And like it, it goes down to a, like it shrinks down to a small like uh you know, like a baby octopus and then it, it's weird it is so it's like it's like it uh it never dies it can just like recycle it and if you know if they have capability to do some shit like that uh, again man that's that that is a weird uh, that is you know that is one of the worst strangest creatures that are you know water between water and land here and sky and the planet even in fossil records you know, you, I mean, we had the only thing you really have is, you know, stories from like sailors and stuff, or like giant octopus. But, you know, you don't have a skeleton. There's nothing that, you know, you can find within that. You know what I'm saying? Unless it's like pressed between uh, some, you know, some sand or silt or something. But even then, you, it's got to have some kind of bones or maybe you just have an outline. But yeah, those things, they're pretty dangerous, man. They're, and they're smart. I mean, who knows? Maybe they are the the aliens as well. Yeah, that that would be the thing, right? What what if it is uh, the, the alien species that maybe genetically modified these things to be to kind of fit whatever world they landed in? That's the bizarre part, right? Because think about that: if they can change their RNA in a flash to what they need, that means the evolution part is cut out of their basic process, right? Their their basic, uh, you know, uh, from from one generation to the next, they stay relatively stable. And so, if it may, so, maybe that is maybe that is the pinnacle of what a uh, you know Darwinian evolution becomes something like that, where you don't need the mutation anymore, the random mutation. You just snap your fingers and change into whatever you need to change into, and that that becomes super weird now because we're talking about this entity, the cephalopod, that's kind of squishy and can take on the form of whatever, right? It, it probably, if it wanted to be in the shape of a bucket, it could be in the shape of a bucket, right? Or or a broom handle or. You know, it could probably make itself be whatever it needs to be. And that's the scary part here is, I mean, we're kind of talking about like a shapeshifter, right? Yeah. I mean, I, there was a one that was, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure you might've seen it, you know, down by a, um, a drilling rig and it was a black, it was like an octopus or squid type thing, but it was pitch black. And it was like, again, it was the, the colors in it from the blood. And, and this thing looked like it was turning inside and out, man. I, I've never seen anything like that shit. That was like, and then it like, it turned like, it, like I said, it like turned inside out and it shot off like it was a, a, like an octopus. Fucking, uh, have you seen that? No, no, I haven't seen that. That's wild. Check that it's like, because there's a lot of the, the drilling rigs. There was another one that looks like a, it's, it's the same type of stuff, you know what I mean? It's, just, it's the same type creature, you know, the cephalopod. 
you know, there were the skin, you know, there were the, really no bones or nothing, but it looked like a big sheet. I don't know if you've seen this one. It looks like a big, it looked like, it just looks like a, like a kind of a see-through uh, brown, you know, kind of see-through, uh, like a, a sheet, you know, that's just floating in the water. And next thing you know, this thing, that thing too was huge. Whatever the fuck that was, is it was huge. And it was, again, it was kind of, you know, it flipped around and then it was like a, turned himself, it almost looked like an octopus or a squid type thing. Yeah, the, if, if, I don't know. I know. I know some people out there listening might have seen those videos, but if I if I were you, bro, I'd, I'd check them out. They're, they're pretty crazy, man. All right, for sure, for sure. If you got if you got a link to that, I'd love to see it. I'll, I can dig it out. If not, um, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, we got Rohan here. Uh, we can get him in. So as as always, up to you. You're welcome to stay. Uh, to complete your call, my friend. You let me know. I'll just uh, kick it out on um, on me. Okay. All right. Uh, chime in whenever, man. You know, you know, you know, you're welcome to be here. Um, all right. That's uh, Kelly in Colorado. Great stuff as always. Appreciate it, my friend. He's going to hang out and lurk in the background. Let's go to the mighty Rohan. What's up, Rohan? The famous Liam Martin. Hey, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, hey Dan, you're on. Yeah, no, not bad. Doing good, man. Doing good. Feeling good. Feeling good. What do you think? Are we off the rails here tonight? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit of a web one, isn't it? But like, it's like I say, there's a... Uh... It is octo- octopi and, um, and I always say octopi and funguses are the prime candidates for extraterrestrials, aren't they? Because they're the two organisms that just really don't fit, do they? They don't fit, fit with anything else, as you mentioned. So, um, and but I know with I know with um, with fungi, they've got spores, aren't they? They can permeate up the atmosphere and hitch a ride on an asteroid. I mean, I don't know how that works with an octopi but like I say maybe some eggs can survive or something but uh, some things that did uh, pop into my mind for me it reminded me of that um, we were just uh, Kelly was just saying about um, there's an octopus that can sort of like rejuvenate itself I don't know about that but I know there's the immortal jellyfish it doesn't naturally die does it you know so some of this marine life it, it can do the miraculous stuff the immortal jellyfish just goes back to its juvenile state like so it's like going back to its stem cells and then it just starts over do you know what I mean and I'd say if you can instantly change your RNA to sort of do things it's almost like they've already locked down all that Wim Hof breathing stuff and we're saying oh maybe some of that can get us down into controlling beyond our autonomic functions and get right into our genes well they've sort of already got it haven't they so then it makes it takes me to that film there's a film with Ryan Reynolds um, called Life where, it, where they go to the International Space Station and they find something from mars it looks like it might be life and they're checking it out and it's a kind of a bit like an octopus but instead of sort of having a brain in each arm the whole tissue is brain but it's also muscle as well and it's also the sort of organ tissue do you know what i mean so if you and that gets really out of hand because it's it sort of rapidly develops do you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Sherry, Sherry here says uh, interestingly uh, on Rockfin. What's up? Says no one's lis- No one listens to me. Well, some people listen to you. Sherry says this: things are brought here. We are a laboratory. <laughs> I think she's onto something. The Gnostics used to say said that. You know, that was the, that was one of the, the base premises of what. Um, y- y- where you've got the archons, I suppose the sort of counter of that is the aeons. That was who like did the experiment sort of thing, and then they said the same thing that you mentioned earlier about this. According to the, uh, I think Ash mentioned it about the remote viewers, and uh, according to the, the Gnostic stuff, that's what they do. These aeons, they've like they don't have a corporeal form, and they live for like ridiculous amounts of time, and they're really like super smart. So they just they literally they invented the human genome. It was one particular aeon because that's what they do they do experiments they do like biological experiments uh, in the galaxy and just wait and see what happens like for fun <laughs> you know that's what the gnostics said and and we've come as a result of her having the idea of making the human genome and the human genome is thought to be quite an efficient thing so it could have more capabilities or whatever do you know what i mean so i don't think that all of that is too far too far off the money yeah i mean it, it all came from somewhere right like like uh we're 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 told that uh we're you know the primordial soup and we're lucky mud right i mean that, that's what we're told it seems unlikely doesn't it it seems yeah. that maybe well, that this actually came from somewhere well, else 
Well, this octopi thing, it looks like if that's not fitting, like you mentioned the Charles Darwin's uh, theory of evolution and stuff, and that's there's a, still a theory. And he, he admitted it towards the end it was sort of incomplete. You know, and, and the thing is that all of that stuff, like say if the octopi doesn't fit it, then it's not really working, is it? And it definitely don't work for us. I don't know if people realise this, but the human neocortex blows it all out of the water. Do you know what I'm saying? It's too, do you know what I'm saying? The human neocortex is a huge mystery. In all of the fossil record, there's been no major organ in a higher animal reorganized itself more miraculously than human neocortex. So it's all blown out of the water anyway with that. The very organ it generates it is its biggest critic sort of thing. So it's an incomplete theory, but like you say, it helps lock, lock you into this idea that it's going to take ages to this, to advance to this. And I think that's all part of dumbing us down. You know, and then, but then, but then the sort of the way that we deal with science socially, because it's all to do with grants and tenure and reputations. And like I say, we do stupid science. Do you know what I mean? Ah, stupid science. Tr uh, trust the science. What's wrong with you, man? Come on, come on, man. It's yeah. not the science that's the problem. It's it's lying motherfuckers and people are omitting the data. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's my issue. Exactly. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? I am the science. Uh, bullshit. Get out of here. <laughs> Tony the Dam says primordial soup is my favorite soup. Well, there it is. <laughs> now we know. Now we know. Let me know how that tastes. <laughs> Sounds delicious. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so 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 what do you think then? If If this stuff, like Sherry said, we are the laboratory here. If this stuff came from somewhere, who's sending it here? Like, again, we're talking about the Cambrian explosion 200 million years ago, approximately uh, this explosion of life on Earth. But they say it didn't seem to be a natural evolutionary process. It seemed like it was brought here from somewhere else because it all happened in like snap your fingers fast, right? In evolutionary scales. But they, that's why they consider that these entities, whatever happened, these cephalopods and the rest of this came from space through this panspermia effect. And, you know, uh, like uh, Jennifer was saying previously when she called in, we're a water planet because it came from space. The water came from space. You don't, well, you know, you don't get yeah. a bunch of dust together and form a ball of dirt and then suddenly it has water. The water came from space. And so that's the mm. craziest part here is, well, are there maybe pockets of water in space kind of floating around? And... Who who sent that stuff here? Back to the Cambrian explosion and all that. Uh, what what yeah. the hell, man? You think there's an alien race out there uh, tinkering with shit? Well, on the on the Cambrian explosion, that came in and was all that ties in with um, environmental changes. See, the the planet at that time had a runaway um, ice cap, and it just became a whole snowball. So what that did was it took away all predators. And then some of the ice is frozen quite clear. So you've got these pockets of light that's getting through, like really, you know, miles of ice sort of thing. So that means there's no predators. So things get a chance to really evolve. Nature gets a chance to do its thing. So I'm wondering if, um, we'll deal with the water and space in a minute, but I'm wondering if, because um, nature can do a lot. And a lot of the time science likes to fob things up and say, well, nature can do anything. Right, well, if that's true, then nature with that, those, environmental circumstances where most things have been wiped out as a runaway you know the whole planet's a, a snowball it, it's locked in ice and it's if it weren't for volcanic activity it would have stayed locked in ice right yeah because you get because once your ice caps start freezing so much then it's reflecting more sunlight and then it just gets run away and then everything freezes okay so you, but, but with all this life wiped away then then whatever life is there gets to thrive it's got no predators so maybe nature can kind of like try something new and make something that's essentially alien do you know what i mean it's not tried it before sort of thing as a, as a way to adapt to the fact that it's had a bit of a start over do you know what i mean yeah so maybe there's a bit of that in there as well right Nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, nature, nature has a way, doesn't it? Uh, and, and we still don't understand the way a lot of that stuff works, which is uh, pretty fantastic. Uh, even though, right, like back to, back to what Ash was saying, all, all the science, all the science, all the science, but we kind of don't know shit. <laughs> we, you know, for all, for all the things we do know, there's still, you know, like a, like an avalanche of things we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of. Yeah. Good, good shit for sure. Um, now, now what about the water in space? Well, with the water in space, yeah, I, I read into that. I couldn't believe it. I posted this a few times. That is, um, it's like 
trillions and trillions of gallons of water being produced in space. That's, that is where, where it comes from. It comes from stars. I don't, I don't think it's every type of star. It might be. But I know a lot of this is stuff that's coming from stars, believe it or not. And it seems counterintuitive when we've all sort of got the mindset that the star's basically like a big fireball because it makes you warm, doesn't it? Like a fire, like a campfire, you know? So you kind of have this idea, but, but no, it starts to produce loads and loads of water. So there's loads of water in space. And you think, well, yeah, space is cold as well. And everything's got ice on, there's ice everywhere. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, and like I say, the, the in its structurally shaped, geometric shapes, uh, a sphere is uh, the strongest shape. You know, a unity in a, of a circle with strong together, right? Well, that's a strong shape, a, a sphere. Okay, so, so like as Jennifer mentioned, water will tend to, it's short in a weightless environment, want to gather together in a ball. So you, you're gonna have clusters of then, do you know, you know what I'm saying? You're gonna have clusters of water bobbing around, aren't you? You know, like you've got the Lagrange point, like a neutral zone for the gravity in between the moon and the earth, where, you know, you stick your satellites so they're not like being affected, you can just sit there, kind of. You know what I mean? So, so you're going to get clusters of water out in space, aren't you? So you're going to get water in space. All he's telling us our water is so essential for life, at least the life we've seen. So, yeah, it's probably going to be you know, water in space, things, asteroids passing through with, you know, spores on it, this, that and the other. You know, it's probably part of the mechanism. So there's a sort of natural version of space travel for life to sort of spread around. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm with you. This is a little bit strange, a little bit weird that uh, it, it's got to come from somewhere. I think that's the, the bizarre part here is uh, where, wherever this DNA is coming from, it, like, again, you know, think about it in, in our terms, right? We're, we're not we're not creating rockets and, you know, putting DNA on them and just sending them out into the wherever, right? Like, so, yeah. so how does it happen? Is it a natural process? I think that's the weird part. Like, like I was saying, well, I was it, it almost to... seems like an alien is, is maybe doing this out there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Or is it that, um, is it, have you thought about this, is it that, do you definitely need, do you need dry land situations to be able to sort of leave the planet and make technology, because making electronics underwater is a no-go, right? But that's not to say there ain't other stuff, do you know what I mean? So I wonder if, because if, if water seems essential for life, and there's loads of water out in space, yeah, I don't know, and there's like oceans and stuff. Maybe things start from oceans, right? So if things start from oceans, maybe some things haven't got much land. So you kind of have to, the evolution has to kind of start, you know. So then maybe you've got, have you got underwater, like you say? Have you got aquatic alien creatures that are as smart as us or more? Do you know what I'm saying? And can they get off the planet? Can Do you get spaceships that's like full of water? Because you've got these aquatic beings in there. Do you know what I'm saying? I know it's been explored in sci-fi and it's kind of hard to, to show it. But I wonder, is that the case? Because we get that from the arrival where these people are coming in this incredibly gas gaseous, toxic environment. And they're like these really tall things with a bunch of legs that are almost like fingers. Do you know what I'm saying? And like tentacles coming out with all hands on. And it's, it's like they talk like that. So it's sort of a bit... Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's strange to think about because, like I say, something truly alien is going to work in really weird ways. So it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Hell yeah, which is uh, off the rails drinking maybe juice, man. It seems like you could definitely get a uh, ticket for too much to think if uh, that's that's the case too much here. So <laughs> uh, definitely good, good, good stuff. Uh, Kelly, you got anything for Rohan here with uh, the stuff he's talking about? Okay. Great same thing we were talking about, you know, everybody was been uh, mentioned in my head. It's just truth. The stars are in there, and that's where it'll be. Cutting out again. A lot of Steve, I don't know, but there's a lot of water in space. Yeah. Probably kind of like deep, like deep water, you know, like where it's a lot of pressure and stuff like that, but it's interesting, man, yeah. uh, to see you know, something like that could be a possibility, and I wouldn't. I know I wouldn't put it past anything because you know, again, we don't really know much about deep space anyway. Yeah, for sure, for sure. 
hundred percent. Good stuff, guys. So, uh, so um, we're we're at the time. We're at the time. I think it is bizarre that uh, the the spiral galaxies have arms, you know, and so the supermassive black hole is sort of creating what you might expect mm. to be an octopus <laughs> in galactic terms, right? Hmm. Yeah, and the stretching out faster than the rotation. That's why they spread out instead of wrapping around. Isn't it? Yep. Pretty odd. Pretty odd. Like a. I wonder if that's a coincidence. Hmm. Maybe that's the planet eater that's roaming around that's eating all the planet. Uh, Galactus, right? Galactus from the uh, the Marvel comics, the planet eater. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, super good stuff. You guys are the best. Uh, uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, what, what are your final thoughts here, Kelly? Um, on, for, for tonight's show, I would say that, uh, you know, as we're talking about how special that creature is, you know, being, you know, different. You know, we also see what type of uh, what type of uh, shapes and you know what it can do. You know, you could take just like pouring it into a glass, which is like cutting out again. I don't know if it's your internet or you're not close to the microphone. I'm not sure, but <laughs> sorry about that. I'm about to say, you know what happened. All right, all right, all good, all good. Appreciate it, Kelly. Kelly in Colorado. Old friend of the show, appreciate it. Great stuff as always. Yeah, cutting in and out. I'm not sure what's going on. All right, um, Rohan, Rohan, awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always, always, yeah. always. I say, there's, there's something going on with these uh, octopi. In there. I seen, I seen a, a little video of like animals that have been helped by people, and sort of had been like grateful kind of thing. But this, yeah, I seen with the octopus, someone found one on a beach, washed up, and the tide had gone out, so he gathered it all, put it in a box, you know, and book it looked after it for a bit, fed it and that, gave it some water, I took it back next day and it said it went to go off in the ocean and then it came back and like put his tentacle up his foot and like touched his ankle before it left as if it was sort of saying thanks. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that's kind of interesting. That's creepy. In like, high five, brother. Yeah. Good looking out. <laughs> yeah, nice one. Take care of yourself, man. Thanks for that. Exactly. Off to the ocean I go. <laughs> yeah. Little yeah. do we know he's a vanguard for some ancient alien AI <laughs> that's hiding in some parallel dimension, spying on us. You know. Exactly. And like uh, like Lacey said when she called in a while ago, be nice to your electronics. Uh, maybe maybe the octopi are the electronics we should be nice to. Tuned into the Archons. <laughs> Shit. It's a big revolution. Right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, pretty wild. It, it, it is. A, and you, you can find um, exactly examples of that. Uh, these super intelligent octopi all over the damn place. Like these stories just, just keep coming. You could look it up over and over how just super intelligent they are. Kind of makes you wonder if they could like send you a text message if you handed them like a, you know, an octopi telephone sort of thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they're talking to the dolphins with the cymatic 3D messages that they send out. Never know. Never know. That's, That's why I grab the fish, isn't it? So it can pass a message on. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what's actually happening here. Yeah, a pretty Hustling wild stuff. Hustling is. Exactly, exactly. Uh, wild, I don't know. Uh, we got the TV trope, the octopoid aliens, and uh, again, the spiral galaxy with the arms. It seems like, uh, you know, again, back to Lovecrafty and Old Ones and Cthulhu, was maybe it is Sagittarius A. Maybe that supermassive black hole is exactly what's happening with... Uh, you know, with this galactic evolution, we've talked about this before with uh, maybe the gray aliens and the biomechanicalness and whatever. But if we're talking about panspermia, that's completely different. And it seems like the, maybe maybe this could be related. Maybe the, the fact that the galaxy is shaped sort of like an octopus is not an accident. And that's that's the bizarre stuff to me. We got some synchronicities here, some coincidences, right? And you know what Albert Einstein said about coincidence? I've, I've dropped this a couple times in the last week. But uh, he said that uh, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And there you go. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. What else you got? Final thought here. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up. And Daryl, if you're there, too. Final thought for me is uh, you can look this one up, folks. It's, it's one of those allegedly things. But yeah, like Vostok, and if you remember Antarctica, it was alleged the, the Russians found uh, an octopus, didn't they? With 14 arms, 14 tentacles. They called it Organism uh, Species 46B, according to Dr. Anton Padalka. 
who defected to Switzerland, said that they found an octopus that pretended to be a diver after it killed one of them, and it changed its body to look like a diver swimming towards them. And he apparently, if it was done, if it's true, but apparently that had, that could shoot out ink like a squid, except it could paralyze you in the water from like about 100 feet. So, so if that's true, that's shit, isn't it? But they say they found it in, in a cave, you know, been locked in there for about 15 million years to evolve on its own as the super predator. So there's always that. <laughs> there's always that. You never know. <laughs> there's always that. I'll have to look into that as well. I, I, I'm not familiar with that story. Uh, definitely maybe juice. Uh, everybody, Rohan's got a podcast. Please give him a follow. His name is uh, Liam Martin, the famous Liam Martin. And it is the mighty Rohan. He's got a, a podcast called Exiled Minds. You can find it. Link in the description down below. Uh, go go check out podca- uh, Rohan's podcast. Pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. I appreciate uh, all, all the hot takes, my friend. Uh, thank you for all the audio work. The audio stuff you hear on this show is also done by the mighty Rohan as well. So uh, as, as you hear that second uh, second hour come in, it's in that weird audio mashup. That's all Rohan. So thank you again for all that great work you're doing, man. Appreciate that very much. Awesome. Cool. And then, oh, yeah. And by the way, everyone, if you check out my podcast, that's in my very first episode, that story. That's the little gold bit at the end. Antarctica. Nice, nice. All right, cool. There it is. It's in. It's in the podcast. Uh, Daryl, Daryl, what's up? Let's wrap this up. What's your final thought here? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know. I'm having um a lot of guilt about um dining on these wonderful creatures. You know, if they're sentient, um, and I believe they probably are. You know. Well, I don't know. All right. Well, Cthulhu's they- taking notes on you. <laughs> so, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully it ain't like that. Hopefully it ain't like that. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it, Daryl. All right, let's uh, let's do it. You guys know what the you guys know the drill. Uh, it goes a little something like this. Let's play the music. Let's uh, click it so you guys can hear. I'm gonna. Uh, could you please mute up, Daryl? You're uh, chirping back through some of the sounds coming through. Sorry, sorry. That. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, it goes a little something like this. So press it so you guys can hear the music as we go well it's the end of the week for troubled minds because we do monday tuesday wednesday thursday uh we are going to do some friday shows coming up so i'm not sure exactly how that's going to look i'll see what the schedule is and i'll work one in or two and we'll see and if we can kind of do that and just make it a thing we'll make it a thing uh, but uh, if you like the show and you, uh, you you appreciate the conversations, again, you know, pretty much nothing's off limits here. We're, we're going to the, uh, the edges of the universe here to try and seek out new life and new civilization. To boldly go where no one has gone before. I've heard that before. Where have I heard that before? I swear I just made that up. No, but how deep can it go? There's a way to talk about, um, right, right, original. sure, <laughs> right. There's a there's a way to to, to to talk about the universe that doesn't include politicizing it. And well, here we are, <laughs> troubled minds. If you like the show, spread the word. Let people know there's a conversation happening that has no boundaries. And we're all over the place and drinking the maybe juice and off the rails. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us. Thanks again to the Night Stalker for inspiring the show tonight. You can't go wrong with Lovecrafty and old ones. And happy birthday to Derek. And um, everybody else out there, thank you so much for participating. Thanks for being part of this. Thanks for all the amazing and thoughtful chat. Thanks for listening to us on the podcast feed. Thanks for spreading the word. If you want to help with the show, Patreon, Rockfin, Twitch, those are three ways to sub up with cash money. If you don't want to do cash money, that's completely fine. It's completely optional. Uh, Just listen to uh, the Troubled Minds podcast. Uh, We've got some ads baked in. kicks us some sense here and there, and it's a good thing. So I appreciate that very much. That's growing like crazy. Everything is growing like crazy. It's, uh, It's at the moment this show is sort of going off the rails all by itself uh so and that's because of us that's because of you it's because of me it's because of all of us like i said i'm me you're you but together we're us and it makes a beautiful thing so thank you again to everybody out there all the amazing calls all the amazing chat all the amazing uh people who supported the show and uh just encouraged it with love and encouragement and all those things it's um like i said that that energy it's, it's hard to ignore it it's 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 a uh, makes it exciting to do this every single night so thank you guys every one of you for uh, for all of that thank you thank you thank you thank you promise you i'm not running for office but thank you anyway i'll say thank you again all right so we're done for the week as we finish we'll we have more troubled minds tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m pacific the troubled minds news show you can find that on twitch otherwise we'll be back with more troubled minds on monday i'll let you know how it looks with the friday show i'll get get you guys updated on that and we'll figure something out thanks again 
as we finish you know how this ends be sure be strong be true thank you for listening from our troubled minds to yours have a great night and there you go now it's time it's time for your falsetto Daryl Uh, thanks guys (laughs) have a great night from our troubled minds to yours have a great night